This is Earl Nightingale with the new edition of Lead the Field. This program is about 12 ideas that will bring order and success into our lives. These ideas will work wonders regardless of what we choose as the main thrust of our lives, for these are the great ideas that have evolved over the centuries, and together they form a constellation by which you and I can safely and successfully navigate. The great Spanish philosopher Ortega reminded us that we human beings are the only creatures on the planet Earth that are born into a natural state of disorientation with our world. That is, while all other creatures are guided by instinct of which they are neither aware nor have the capacity to question, each of us, as human creatures, was given the godlike power to create his or her own life, and each of us does exactly that all the years of his or her life. Every day we put in place actions and ideas that will determine the shape and substance of our tomorrows. For some, those ideas and actions lead inevitably to extraordinary achievement and rewards. For most, they tend to lead to a kind of middle ground in which great numbers of people take their cues from each other without question or consideration. And for some, those actions and ideas lead to repeated frustration and problems as they spend their lives in the bottom layers of the socio-economic pyramid. Success or failure as a human being is not a matter of luck or circumstance or fate or the breaks or who you know or any of the other tiresome old myths and cliches by which the ignorant tend to excuse themselves. It's a matter of following a common sense paradigm of rules guidelines anyone can follow. Now, this program, Lead the Field, has changed more lives, brought about more success stories, helped create more millionaires, saved more careers, important jobs, and marriages than any other program ever produced. And the rules we talk about here don't change. They apply to any situation, under any and all circumstances. We never have to say, I wonder what will work in this particular situation. All we have to do is make these ideas our own. And we begin with what I call the magic word. We all want good results from life in our home, our work, and in all our contacts with other people. And the most important single factor to guarantee good results day in, day out, all the months and years of our lives, is a healthy attitude. Attitude is the magic word. Attitude is defined as the position or bearing as indicating action, feeling, or mood. And it is our actions, feelings, or moods which determine the actions, feelings, and moods of others. Our attitude tells the world what we expect in return. If it's a cheerful, expectant attitude, it says to everyone with whom we come in contact that we expect the best in our dealings with our world. You see... We tend to live up to our expectations, and others give to us, as far as their attitudes are concerned, what we expect. Our attitude is something we can control. We can establish our attitude each morning when we start our day. In fact, we do just that whether we realize it or not. And the people in our family, all the people in our world, will reflect back to us the attitude we present to them. It is then our attitude toward life which determines life's attitude toward us, cause and effect. Everything we say or do will cause a corresponding effect. If we're cheerful, glad to be experiencing this miracle of life, others will reflect that good cheer back to us. We are the kind of person others enjoy being around. You and I are responsible for our lives. You and I produce causes all day long, every day of our lives. The environment can only return to us a corresponding effect. That's why I say each of us determines the quality of his or her own life. We get back what we put out. Now here's a way to test the past quality of your attitude. Would you say people tend to react to you in a smiling, positive manner with friendly greetings when you appear? Your answer to that question will tell the story. I remember the time when a man and his wife bought a home across the street from me in Florida. They had moved there from Minnesota. They had planned the move for years. They were tired of the northern winters, and he was an avid fisherman. Several months passed after their move, and one day I was surprised to see them packing. 
I walked across the street and asked the man if they were leaving so soon after they made the move. He nodded. My wife hates it here, he said. We're going back home. I asked him how in the world his wife could hate it there, what his wife didn't like about the place, and with a few questions, the truth came out. She hasn't been accepted here, he said. The other women of the community have left her strictly alone. She's made no friends. She hasn't been asked to participate in any of the community activities. So I asked him, has she let the other women know she's interested in participating in community activities? He stopped what he was doing and looked at me. No, he said. No, she hasn't. She's been waiting for the women to ask her. And since she stayed in the house, waiting for them to come to her, they've thought of her as reclusive, as a person who's not interested in making friends. So they've left her alone. Well, there was a long silence, and he began nodding. Yes, that's exactly what's happened, he said. Yes, the women of the neighborhood should have come to her and introduced themselves or invited her to a tea or luncheon, but they were reacting to her. She didn't know that the community could only give her back a reflection of her own attitude. He was a woman in her 60s who had never learned the first important rule for successful living, that our surroundings will always reflect us, that our environment is a mirror, often a merciless mirror, of ourselves. As soon as a person begins to change, his or her surroundings will change. And it works like this. Great attitude, great results. Good attitude, good results. Fair or average attitude, fair or average results. Poor attitude, poor results. So each of us shapes his or her own life. And to an altogether unexpected extent, the shape and texture, the quality or the lack of quality of our lives is determined by our habitual attitude. That sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's not quite that easy. For most of us, learning this new habit takes time. But once it becomes a habit-knit part of our lives, our world will change as dramatically as would walking from a dark cave into the bright light of day. Most people never think about their attitudes at all. For most of them, it's a matter of beginning each day in neutral. Their attitudes are neither good nor bad, but are poised to react to whatever stimuli they encounter. If the stimulus is good, they'll reflect it. If it's bad, they'll reflect that too. They're chameleons, and they go through their days reacting to whatever confronts them. And these are the people of our environment. That's why it's so important for us to control our attitudes to make sure they're excellent or good. A person with a poor attitude toward learning, for example, isn't going to learn very much. I know you can think of examples of this in your own life. If we take the attitude that we can't do something, we generally will not do it. An attitude of failure, and we're whipped before we start. It was William James of Harvard, the founder of psychology in America, who said, human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes of mind. In trying to describe the attitude that's worked so well for me over the years, I found myself using two important words, gratitude and expectant. First, I'm grateful for the opportunity to live on this beautiful and astonishing planet Earth. I wake up with a sense of gratitude in the morning. Secondly, I expect the best. I expect to reach the goals I establish for myself, about which we'll talk a good deal more later in the program. I find the idea of fulfilling those goals agreeable, hence the attitude of expectancy. I know the world will give me back what I put out in the way of attitude, so it's up to me. I'm responsible. There are millions of human beings living narrow, darkened, frustrated lives, living defensively simply because they take a defensive, doubtful attitude toward themselves and, as a result, toward life in general. A person with a poor attitude becomes a magnet for unpleasant experiences. When those experiences come, as they must because of his attitude, they tend to reinforce his poor attitude, thereby bringing more problems and so on. The person becomes an example of self-generating, doom-fulfilling prophecy. And it's all a matter, believe it or not, of attitude. We get what we expect, and our outlook on life is a kind of paintbrush, and with it we paint our world. It can be bright and filled with hope and satisfaction, or it can be dark and gloomy, lugubrious. 
It's hard to convince people sometimes that the world they experience is a reflection of their attitude. They take the attitude that if people would only be nice to them, they'd be nice in return. They're like the person sitting in front of the cold stove waiting for the heat. Until they put in the fuel, there's not going to be any heat. It's up to them to act first. It has to start somewhere. Let it begin with us. Attitude is the reflection of the person inside. Consider for a moment the people who go sailing through life from one success to another and who, when they occasionally fail at something, shrug it off and head right out again. No matter what a person does, wherever you find a person doing an outstanding job and getting outstanding results, you'll find a person with a good attitude. These people take the attitude toward themselves that they can accomplish what they set out to accomplish. They take the attitude that achievement is the natural order of things, and it is. That there's no good reason on earth why they can't be as successful, as competent as anyone else. They have a healthy attitude toward themselves and as a result toward life and the things they want to accomplish. And because of that, they accomplish some remarkable things and come to be called successful and outstanding and brilliant and lucky and so on. They're quite frequently no smarter or more talented than most other people. But they have the right attitude. They find their accomplishments not too difficult simply because it seems so few others are really trying or really believe in themselves. As to luck, forget it. Luck is what happens when preparedness meets opportunity, and opportunity is there all the time. A person can be very efficient at his or her work, but if the corresponding excellent attitude isn't present, well, the person's a failure. A robot can do a great job, but only a human being can ennoble work with a great attitude and by so doing touch it with the magic of humanness, make it come alive and sing, make it truly worthwhile. That, my friend, makes the difference. Successful people come in all sizes, shapes, ages, and colors, and in widely varying degrees of intelligence and education, but they have one thing in common. They expect more good out of life than bad. They expect to succeed more often than they fail, and they do. Now there are things you want, worthwhile things. Take the attitude that there are a lot more reasons why you can reach those goals than fail in the attempt. Go after them, work at it, keep your attitude positive, cheerful, and expectant, and you'll get them, and as you do, you'll grow to new plateaus and be able to accomplish still more. And remember this, our environment... The world in which we find ourselves living and working is a mirror of our attitudes and expectations. If we feel that our environment could stand some improvement, we can bring about that change for the better by improving our attitude. The world plays no favorites. It's impersonal. It doesn't care who succeeds or who fails, nor does it care if we change. Our attitude toward life doesn't affect the world and the people in it nearly so much as it affects us. It would be impossible to even estimate the number of jobs that have been lost, promotions or good grades missed, sales lost or marriages ruined by poor attitudes. But you can number in the millions the jobs which are held but hated, the marriages which are tolerated but unhappy, the parents and children who fail to understand and love one another, all because of people who are waiting for the world and others to change toward them. They don't understand that what they're getting is a reflection of themselves. Nothing can change until we do. When we change, our worlds will change. The answer is attitude. How does one develop a good attitude? The same way one develops any other factor, practice. One good way is to stick a small sign on the bathroom mirror on which is printed the word attitude. That way you'll see it first thing every morning. You might have another one in your car and at your place of work. We need to smile more, speak to people, go out to people. Everything in the world we want to do or get done, we must do with and through people. Every dollar we will ever earn must come from people. Everything worthwhile, the person we love and with whom we want to spend the rest of our life, is a human being with whom we must interact. Our children are individuals, each different from any other person who ever lived. And what affects them most is our attitude, the loving kindness they see and feel whenever we're around them. If you begin to develop and hold an attitude that says yes to life, 
and the world, you'll be astonished at the changes you'll see. Someone once said, life is dull only to dull people. It's true, of course. It's also true that life is interesting only to interesting people, and life is successful only for successful people. We must be the epitome, the embodiment. We must radiate success before it'll come to us. We must first become mentally, from an attitude standpoint, the people we wish to become. Many years ago, a famous Los Angeles restaurateur was asked by a newspaper reporter, when did you become successful? And he replied, I was successful when I was dead broke. I knew what I wanted to do, and I knew I'd do it. It was only a matter of time. He had a successful attitude long before the success he sought had become a reality. The great German philosopher and writer, Goethe, put it this way, Before you can do something, you must be something. But let me prove my point by giving you a test. If you will conscientiously go about the test I'll outline and concentrate on it every day, you will find yourself becoming lucky, as the uninitiated call it. All sorts of wonderful things will begin happening in your life, and it'll show you what a great attitude can mean. So here's the test. Treat every person with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth. Now, you do that for three excellent reasons. One, as far as every person is concerned, he or she is the most important person on earth. Two, because that's the way human beings ought to treat each other. And three, by treating everyone this way, we begin to form an important habit. There's nothing in the world that men, women, and children want to need more than self-esteem, the feeling that they're important, that they're recognized, that they're needed, that they count and are respected. They will give their love, their respect, and their business to the person who fills this need, even if it's a short encounter. Have you ever noticed that the higher you go in any organization of value, the nicer the people seem to become? It works this way. The bigger the people, the easier it is to talk to them, to get along with them, and work with them. So they naturally matriculate to the top. It's their attitudes. And the people with great attitudes just naturally gravitate to the top of whatever business or department they're in. They don't have great attitudes because of their positions. They have their positions largely because of their great attitudes. For the purposes of this test, act toward others in exactly the same manner that you want them to act toward you. Treat the members of your family as the very important people they really are, the most important in the world. Carry out into the world each morning the kind of attitude you'd have if you were the most successful person on earth. Notice how quickly it develops into a habit. And almost immediately a change will be noticed. Irritations that used to frustrate you begin to disappear. When some less informed person gives you a bad time, don't let his poor attitude infect yours. Keep yours in hand. Keep it good. Keep cool, above it all, and smiling. If someone cuts in front of your car or acts in any other manner that shows a lack of courtesy, don't react as he would. Smile it off. Destructive emotions such as anger, hatred, or jealousy don't hurt others. They hurt you. They can make your life miserable. They can make you sick. Forgive everyone who ever hurt you. Really forgive them. And then forgive yourself. That's all past. Stewing over it, exhuming it, can only make you sick. Forgive and forget it. Get rid of it. You've risen above that sort of thing. And as you develop a great attitude, you'll probably realize that you've already placed yourself on the road to what you seek. You're well on your way. It makes no difference how successful you may have been in the past. You'll be delighted with the ease and comfort of your new life. The bad or poor attitudes of others can be as infectious as the common cold. It's important that we look on them in this light as infectious conditions that can only end by hurting and annoying us if we allow ourselves to catch them. Like the doctor, often working with people with infectious conditions, we must keep ourselves healthy. We simply don't have time for that sort of thing. Whoever started the cliché, life's too short, certainly knew what he or she was talking about. It really is too short, much too short, to spend any of our valuable time mimicking the attitudes of others, unless they're good. A great attitude does much more than turn on the lights in our worlds. It seems to magically connect us to all sorts of serendipitous opportunities that were somehow absent before the change. 
Maybe that's what people mean when they say we're lucky. Suddenly we do find ourselves getting the so-called breaks, but it's really nothing more than this new connection with the world that comes with a great attitude. We find ourselves doing more, and doing it in less time. We put ourselves directly in the path of all kinds of serendipitous happenings. When you begin to develop a better attitude, you should realize that you've already placed yourself in the top 5% of the people, the most successful people on earth. You've placed yourself on the road to what you seek. You've prepared the ground. You've only to plant the seed. Now, in summing up, here are a few points to keep in mind. First, it's our attitude at the beginning of a difficult task which, more than anything else, will bring about its successful outcome. Secondly, our attitudes toward others determine their attitudes toward us. We're all interdependent. The success we achieve in life will depend largely on how well we relate to others. Thirdly, before you can achieve the kind of life you want, you must think, act, talk, and conduct yourself in all of your affairs as would the person you wish to become. Keep a mental picture of that person before you as often as you can during the day. And fourthly, remember that the higher you go in any organization of value, the better the attitudes you'll find, and that attitudes are not the result of success. Success is the result of great attitudes. And finally, the deepest craving of the human being is for recognition and self-esteem, to be needed, to feel important, to be recognized and appreciated. That includes our loved ones and all the people with whom we come in contact during our days. To make these important principles a habit-knit part of our lives, here are some suggestions. Since our minds can hold only one thought at a time, make the thoughts you hold constructive and positive. Look for the best in people and ideas. Be constantly alert for new ideas you can put to use in your life. Don't waste time talking about your problems to people who can't solve them, or your health, unless it's good, or you're talking to your doctor. It won't help you. It cannot help others. Radiate the attitude of well-being and confidence, the attitude of the person who knows where he or she's going. You'll find all sorts of good things happening to you. And lastly, treat everyone with whom you come in contact as the most important person on earth. Start this habit, practice it consistently, and you'll do it, and benefit from it for the rest of your life. Thank you. In the year 1843, a man was born who was to have a profound effect upon the lives of millions of people. His name was Russell Herman Conwell. He became a lawyer, then a newspaper editor, and finally a clergyman. It was during his church career that an incident occurred which was to change his life and the lives of countless others. One day a group of young people came to Dr. Conwell at his church and asked him if he'd be willing to instruct them in college courses. They all wanted a college education but lacked the money to pay for it. He told them to let him think about it and come back in a few days. After they left, an idea began to form in Dr. Conwell's mind. He asked himself, why couldn't there be a fine college for poor but deserving young people? And before very long, the idea consumed him. Why not indeed? It was a project worthy of 100% dedication, complete commitment, and almost single-handedly Dr. Conwell raised several million dollars with which he founded Temple University, today one of the country's leading schools. He raised the money by giving more than 6,000 lectures all over the country, and in each one of them he told a story called Acres of Diamonds. It was a true story, which had affected him very deeply, and it had the same effect on his audiences. The money he needed to build the college came pouring in. 
The story was the account of an African farmer who heard tales about other farmers who had made millions by discovering diamond mines. These tales so excited the farmer that he could hardly wait to sell his farm and go prospecting for diamonds himself. So he sold the farm and spent the rest of his life wandering the African continent searching unsuccessfully for the gleaming gems which brought such high prices on the markets of the world. Finally, the story goes, worn out and in a fit of despondency, he threw himself into a river and drowned. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, or farm in this case, the man who had bought his farm happened to be crossing the small stream on the property when suddenly there was a bright flash of blue and red light from the stream bottom. He bent down, picked up the stone, it was a good-sized stone, and admiring it, later put it on his fireplace mantle as an interesting curiosity. Several weeks later, a visitor picked up the stone, looked closely at it, hefted it in his hand, and nearly fainted. He asked the farmer if he knew what he'd found. When the farmer said no, that he thought it was a piece of crystal, the visitor told him he had found one of the largest diamonds ever discovered. While the farmer had trouble believing that, he told the man that his creek was full of such stones, not as large, perhaps, as the one on the mantel, but, well, they were sprinkled generously throughout the creek bottom. Needless to say, the farm the first farmer had sold so that he might find a diamond mine turned out to be the most productive diamond mine on the entire African continent. The first farmer had owned, free and clear, acres of diamonds, but had sold them for practically nothing in order to look for them elsewhere. Well, the moral is clear. If the first farmer had only taken the time to study and prepare himself, to learn what diamonds looked like in their rough state, and since he had already owned a piece of the African continent, to thoroughly explore the property he had before looking elsewhere, all of his wildest dreams would have come true. Now, the thing about this story that so profoundly affected Dr. Conwell and subsequently millions of others was the idea that each of us is at this moment standing in the middle of his or her own acres of diamonds. If we'll only have the wisdom and patience to intelligently and effectively explore the work in which we're now engaged, to explore ourselves, we'll usually find the riches we seek, whether they be financial or intangible or both. Before we go running off to what we think are greener pastures, let's make sure that our own is not just as green or perhaps even greener. It's been said that if the other guy's pasture appears to be greener than ours, it's quite possible that it's getting better care. Besides, while we're looking at other pastures, other people are looking at ours. There are few things more pitiful to my mind than the person who wastes his life running from one thing to another, forever looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and never staying with one thing long enough to find it. No matter what your goal may be, perhaps the road to it can be found in the very thing you're now doing. It wasn't until he was completely paralyzed by polio and forced to reach into the rich resources of his mind that a courageous farmer got the idea of producing exceptionally good meat products on his farm. From that idea, one of the country's most successful meatpacking companies was born. His farm contained acres of diamonds, too. He just never had to dig for them before. Your mind is your richest resource. Let it thoroughly explore the possibilities lurking in what you're presently doing before turning to something new. I say that because there were probably good reasons for your having chosen your present work in the beginning. If there weren't, and if you're unhappy in the field you're in, well, then perhaps it's time for some serious exploration. Dr. Russell Conwell's life is a living example of the importance of a willingness to change once one's own pasture has been thoroughly explored. I said that Dr. Conwell began as a lawyer, then later changed to become a newspaper editor before he finally found his true calling as a clergyman and the founder of a great university. One of the best examples of a person finding acres of diamonds hiding in his work is Stu Leonard of Connecticut. He began as a dairy root delivery man. As he worked his rounds, he began to think of all the products connected to the dairy business that his customers really needed. He bought a working dairy with very little down and a lot of hard work and began building his business around it keeping the working dairy intact in the center of his operations and surrounding it with windows through which his customers could watch the process, he began adding other products. Today his dairy store is the largest in the world, and it sells everything in the food line. 
People come from all over the entire area to shop at Stu Leonard's Dairy Store, and they love it, and he loves them. People who are too old or infirm to come to his store on their own are picked up in Stu Leonard's buses and brought to the store. He has a multi-million dollar business that grew out of a delivery route. The diamonds were there, and Stu Leonard made the most of them. Every kind of work has such opportunity lurking within it. The opportunities are there now, clamoring to be noticed, but they cannot speak or print signs for us to read. Our part of the bargain is to look at our work with new eyes, with the eyes of creation. Tired de Chardin said, It is our duty as men and women to proceed as though limits to our abilities do not exist. We are collaborators in creation. A man I knew in Arizona began with a small gas station. One day, sitting at his desk and watching through the window while one of his young attendants filled a man's gas tank, he watched the customer while he stood about waiting for the job to be finished. It dawned upon him that that man had money in his pockets and there were things he needed or wanted that he'd pay for if they were conveniently displayed where he could see them. So he began adding things. Fishing tackle, then fishing licenses hunting and camping equipment, rifles, shotguns, ammunition, hunting licenses. He found an excellent line of aluminum fishing boats and trailers. He began buying up the contiguous property around him. Then he added an auto parts department. He'd always carried cold soft drinks and candy, but now he added an excellent line of chocolates in a refrigerated case. Before long, he sold more chocolates than anyone else in the state. He carried thousands of things his customers could buy while waiting for their cars to be serviced. All the products he sold also guaranteed that most of the gas customers in town would come to his station. He sold more gas. He began cashing checks on Friday, and the bonanza grew and grew. It all started with a man with a human brain watching a customer standing around with money in his pockets and nothing to spend it on. Others would have lived and died with the small service station, and they do. My friend saw the diamonds. Both my friend in Arizona and Stu Leonard in Connecticut are customer-oriented. Serve the customer. Serve the customer better than anyone else is serving the customer. Stu Leonard has his company policy conspicuously displayed in his store for all to read, and it goes like this. Rule number one, the customer is always right. Rule number two, if you think the customer is wrong, read rule number one again. <laughs> Many service station operators, upon seeing a wealthy customer drive in, might say to themselves, I ought to be in his business. Not so. There's just as much opportunity in one business as another, if we'll only stop playing copycat with each other and begin to think creatively, begin to think in new directions. It's there, believe me, and it's our job to find it. Take the time to stand off and look at your work, as a stranger might, and ask, why does he do it that way? Has he noticed how what he's doing might be capitalized upon or multiplied? If you're happy with things as they are, then by all means keep them that way. But there's great fun in finding diamonds hiding in ourselves and in our work. We never get bored or blasé or find ourselves in a rut. A rut, we're reminded, is really nothing more than a grave with the ends kicked out. Some of the most interesting businesses in the world grew out of what was originally a very small idea in a very small area. If something is needed in one town, then the chances are it's also needed in all towns and cities all over the country. You might also ask yourself, how good am I at what I'm presently doing? Do you know all there is to know about your work? Would you call yourself a first-class professional at your work? How would your work stand up against the work of others in your line? The educator and author J.B. Matthews wrote, Unless a person has trained himself for his chance, the chance will only make him ridiculous. A great occasion is worth to a man exactly what his preparation enables him to make of it. I'm sure Dr. Matthews intended to include the female half of the world in that statement. I'm often appalled by how little people know about the business they're in. That's not my department, they'll say. I suppose if they see a fire starting in someone else's department, they wouldn't report it. Most real estate people don't sell homes and property. They show homes and property, something a six-year-old child could do. They often know nothing at all about selling or marketing, yet they call themselves real estate professionals. They're actually tour guides. 
This is the living room, they say to intelligent men and women who already know, know what a living room looks like. Someone, come to think of it, I think it was me, once wrote that the human race is much like a convoy in time of war. The whole menagerie is slowed down to protect the slowest ships, and they march on in that dusty valley, unmindful of the diamonds beneath their feet. The first thing we need to do to become a diamond miner is to break away from the crowd and quit assuming that because people in the millions are living that way, it must be the best way. It is not the best way. It's the average way. The people going the best way are way out in front. They're so far ahead of the crowd you can't even see their dust anymore. They're the people who live and work on the leading edge, the cutting edge, and they mock the way for all the rest. We have a choice to make, really, you and I. It takes imagination, curious imagination, to know that diamonds don't look like cut and polished gemstones in their rough state, nor does a pile of iron ore look like stainless steel. To prospect your own acres of diamonds, develop a faculty we might call intelligent objectivity. The faculty to stand off and look at your work as a person from Mars might look at it. Within the framework of what industry or profession does your job fall? Do you know all you can about your industry or profession? Isn't it time for a refreshing change of some kind? How can the customer be given a better break? Each morning ask yourself, how can I increase my service today? There are rare and very marketable diamonds lurking all around me. Have I been looking for them, examining every facet of my work and of the industry or profession in which it has its life? There are better ways to do what I'm presently doing. What are they? How will my work be performed 20 years from now? Everything in the world is in a state of evolution and improvement. How can I do what will eventually be done anyway now? Think of what Stu Leonard did with his dairy route, and my Arizona friend with his small service station, what famous Amos did with his chocolate chip cookies, what Procter & Gamble did with soap. Sure, there's risk involved. There's no growth of any kind without risk. We start running risks when we get out of bed in the morning. Risks are good for us. They bring out the best that's in us. They brighten the eye and get the mind cooking. They quicken the step and put a new shining look on our days. Human beings should never be settled. It's okay for chickens and cows and cats, but it's wrong for human beings. People start to die when they become settled. We need to keep things stirred up. Back in 1931... Lloyd C. Douglas, the world-famous novelist who wrote The Robe, Magnificent Obsession, and other best-selling books, wrote a magazine article titled Escape. Now, in that article, Douglas asked, Who of us has not at some time toyed briefly with the temptation to run away? If all the people who have given that idea the temporary hospitality of their imagination were to have acted upon it, few would be living at their present addresses. And of the small minority who did carry the impulse into effect, it's doubtful if many ever disengaged themselves as completely as they had hoped from the problems that hurled them forth. More often than otherwise, it may be surmised, they packed up their troubles in their old kit bags and took them along. The point of the article was simply, don't try to run away from your troubles. Overcome them. Prevail right where you are. What we're really after is not escape from our perplexities and frustrations, but a triumph over them. And one of the best ways to accomplish that is to get on course and stay there. Restate and reaffirm your goal, the thing you want most to do, the place in life you want most to reach. See it clearly in your mind's eye, just as you can envision the airport in Los Angeles when you board your plane in New York. Or like a great ship in a storm, just keep your heading and your engines running. The storm will pass, although sometimes it seems that it never will. And one bright morning, you'll find yourself passing the harbor light. Then you can give a big sigh of relief, rest a while, and almost before you know it, you'll find your eyes turning seaward again. You'll think of a new harbor you'd like to visit, a new voyage upon which to embark. And once again, you'll set out. And that's just the way this funny-looking, two-legged, curious, imaginative, tinkering, fiddling dreamer called a human being operates. He escapes from problems not by running away from them, but by overcoming them. And no sooner does he overcome one set of problems, but he starts looking around for new and more difficult pickles to get himself into and out of. So if you find yourself looking at travel folders and thinking of running away, go ahead. Think about it. 
It'll get your mind off things for a while. Then zero in on your goal, more about that later, and get busy. Take one thing at a time, and before you know it, you'll start seeing those diamonds scattered all over your world, and you'll be out in the clear again. If you feel like running away from it all once in a while, you're perfectly normal. If you stay and get rid of your problems by working your way through them, you're a successful citizen. Start taking an hour a day with a legal pad and dissect your work. Take it apart and look at its constituent parts. There's opportunity there. That's your acre of diamonds. The stories of people achieving unusual success despite all manner of handicaps never failed to capture our attention. They're inspirational to be sure, but they're much more than that if we study them closely. The boy whose legs were terribly burned and who was told he'd be lucky to ever walk again becomes a champion track star. The woman, blind and deaf from birth, becomes one of the most inspirational figures of the century. And the poor children, who rise to fame and fortune, have nearly become commonplace. In this age of unprecedented immigration, we read and see on television examples of people who arrived in this country without any money and without knowing a word of English, and who, within a surprisingly short time, have become wonderfully successful. In fact, the typical Korean family that has emigrated to the United States during the past 20 years has a higher average income than the average American family that was born and went to school here. Now, how does that happen? Freedom, personal liberty, is the most precious thing on earth. It is also one of the rarest, hence its great value. People who manage to get to America despite mountainous problems and miles of red tape often find themselves free for the first time in their lives. It's a joyous, wonderful experience for them. And in this newfound freedom, they set to work to find a place for themselves. They go to work serving their new country and its people. Time means nothing to them. But being free to pursue their own ends in the richest, freest country on the planet is everything. They all go to work, and they work hard, and their work is excellent, first class, as good as they can do it, and it's priced fairly. You don't see them marching, demanding higher pay or shorter hours. All they want is the opportunity, and once that's theirs, they make the most of it. In New York City, a Korean family managed to buy a small convenience grocery store in midtown Manhattan. The first thing they did was clean it. It sparkled with cleanliness. Then they stocked it with everything they felt the people in their area wanted in the way of things you find in a grocery store. They were open early in the morning. They stayed open late at night. They never failed to smile and give a friendly greeting to their customers. Naturally, they became wonderfully successful. They were open seven days a week. One day, customers coming to the store found it closed, and on the door was a sign giving the reason why. It read, We've gone to Yale University to watch our son graduate. That's an American story. The true story of people who found joy in freedom and in the opportunity to serve their fellow man and make the most of it. What sets these people with such vast handicaps, such as not knowing the language, not knowing the right people, not having any money? Or the boy with the burned legs who becomes the champion runner, or a Helen Keller blind and deaf at birth? What in the world is the answer? The answer, if fully understood will bring you and me anything and everything we truly want, and it's deceptively simple. We touched on it in our last message. Perhaps it's too simple. The people we've talked about here and the thousands currently doing the same thing all over the country are in possession of something the average American doesn't have. They have goals. They have a burning desire to succeed despite all handicaps. They know exactly what they want, they think about it every day of their lives. It gets them up in the morning, and it keeps them giving their very best all day long. It's the last thing they think about before dropping off to sleep at night. 
They have a vision of exactly what they want to do, and that vision carries them over every obstacle. This vision, this dream, this goal, invisible to all the world except the person holding it, is responsible for perhaps every great advance and achievement of humankind. It's the underlying motive for just about everything we see about us. Everything worthwhile achieved by men and women is a dream come true, a goal reached. It's been said that what the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. It's the fine building where before there was an empty lot or an ancient eyesore. It's the bridge spanning the bay. It's landing on the moon. And it's that little convenience store in midtown Manhattan. It's the lovely home on a tree-shaded street and the young person accepting the diploma. It's the new baby in its mother's arms. It's a low golf handicap and a position reached in the world of business. It's a certain income attained or amount of money invested. What the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. We become what we think about. And when we're possessed by an exciting goal, we reach it. That's why it's been said, be choosy, therefore, what you set your heart upon. For if you want it strongly enough, you'll get it. Amen to that. It's been said that Americans can have anything they want. The trouble is, they don't know what they want. Oh, they want little things. They want a new car. They get it. They want a new refrigerator. They get it. They want a new home, and they get it. The system never fails for them, but they don't seem to understand that it is a system, nor that if it'll work for a refrigerator or a new car, it will work for anything else they want very much, just as well. Perhaps that's best. People come in all shapes and sizes and with goals of infinitely varying specifications, if they have goals at all. Once a person fully and emotionally understands that the goals that are important to him or her can become real in his or her life, well, it's like opening a jack-in-the-box. All sorts of interesting and exciting things begin to happen. Quite often we become truly alive for the first time in our lives. We look back at our former lives and realize we were shuffling along in a kind of lockstep, that we were actually taking our cues from those about us in the unspoken assumption that we're all alike, when nothing could be farther from the truth. We are not all alike. Each of us is quite different, with different abilities, different genetic profiles, different wants in life. What will wonderfully satisfy one particular family and represent complete success for them would be considered failure for another family, all because of their different aspirations, their different plateaus in life, the difference in their lifestyles, upbringings, education. Every facet of our environment as youngsters has an effect upon us and helps to set our course in life. The youngster who knew poverty as a child might aspire to be rich. He might overcompensate because of the desolation of his youth. While another young man raised in an upper-middle-class family who always had just about everything he wanted might settle for a very middle-class adulthood. Things we've always had aren't as important to us as they are to those who've been without them. We talked about freedom on the preceding message and how dear it is to those who never had it while most Americans take it for granted and never even think about it. If you ask most Americans what the most important thing in the world is for a human being, chances are they'd seldom come up with freedom. Yet as Archibald MacLeish wrote in his fine play, The Secret of Freedom, the secret of happiness is freedom. And the secret of freedom, courage. To understand the subject and the importance of goal-setting, we have to realize that it's the very basis of any success. It is, in fact, the very definition of success. The best definition of success I've ever found goes like this. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy goal, or in some cases, the pursuit of a worthy ideal. If you'll give these definitions some thought, I think you'll agree with me. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy goal. That's a beautiful definition of success. It means that anyone who's on course toward the fulfillment of a goal is successful. Now, success doesn't lie in the achievement of a goal, although that's what the world considers success. It lies in the journey toward the goal. We're successful as long as we're working toward something we want to bring about in our lives. That's when the human being is at his or her best. That's what Cervantes meant when he wrote, 
The road is better than the inn. Quite often romantic stories end with the loving couple getting married. That's just the beginning of the real story. When the young person stands before his school's president or principal and receives the diploma, that's called commencement. That's the beginning. It's an important milestone, to be sure, and congratulations are certainly in order. But where are you going from there? Once a person has realized the goal for which he or she has so assiduously toiled, that's wonderful. It's time for a rest and some self-congratulations, time to savor the achievement. But we're no longer successful, by my definition, until we set a new higher goal toward which to work. We're at our best when we're climbing, thinking, planning, working, when we're on the road toward something we want to bring about. I don't mean by this that we should become workaholics. Far from it. In fact, it's been well established that the most successful men and women manage to live in a wonderful state of balance with lots of recreation. Take that word recreate apart when you've got some time and you'll find it interesting. And they get lots of rest. The mind works best when we're properly rested and our minds are the best and most important parts of us, regardless of what we choose to do. Did you ever hear an athlete say, it's about 90% mental? Whatever the percentage really is in a good game of golf or tennis, it's very large. As we pointed out in the magic word, our mental attitude can make all the difference between winning and losing. With our definition, success being the progressive realization of a worthy goal, we cover all the bases. The young person working to finish school is as successful as any person on earth. The person working toward a particular position with his or her company is just as successful. If you have a goal that you find worthy of you as a person, a goal that fills you with joy at the thought of it, believe me, you'll reach it. But as you draw near and see that the goal will soon be achieved, begin to think ahead to the next goal you're going to set. It often happens that a writer, halfway through a book, will hit upon the idea for his next one and begin making notes or ideas for a title even while he's finishing work on the one in progress. That's the way it should be. One of my favorite poems is by Rabindranath Tagore, the distinguished Calcutta poet, and it goes like this. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I woke and saw that life was duty. I acted, and behold, duty was joy. We are at our very best, and we are happiest when we are fully engaged in work we enjoy on the journey toward the goal we've established for ourselves. It gives meaning to our time off and comfort to our sleep. It makes everything else in life so wonderful, so worthwhile. Most people, when they think of the word success, tend to equate it with lots of money. Sometimes that's a natural part of the goal and tells us how well we're doing, but not always by any means. Success is whatever we want it to be that is worthy of us, That's why I commented earlier that success may also be defined as the pursuit of a worthy ideal. For example, I can't imagine anyone being more successful than an outstanding teacher who's striving to know more about the art of teaching and the subject matter that will catch the interest of his or her pupils, who understands that every student is different and learns at a different rate of speed. Joy and satisfaction come to us from serving others and there are literally millions of ways of doing that. For those whose goals involve the serving of great numbers of people, chances are they'll be richly rewarded indeed. In fact, for many, a goal is a certain level of income or a certain amount of money in an investment account. A goal is an individual thing, as individual as the person, him or herself. Since no two people are exactly alike, it stands to reason that no two of us will have exactly the same goals. One thing a goal must do, however, is fill us with positive emotion when we think about it. It must be something we want very much to bring about. The more intensely we feel about a goal, the more assuredly the idea buried deep in our subconscious will direct us along the path to its fulfillment. I once used the quotation, No one gets rich without enriching others. I received a letter from a man in Utah who wrote, How about those who get rich in the drug trade or those who produce and sell pornography? How do they enrich others? It was a good question, especially in these times. I wrote back to him and told him that my definition of success is the progressive realization 
of a worthy goal. Certainly people in the drug and pornography business would not qualify as successful. What they're doing is counterproductive, destructive, and involves, in the case of drugs, the enslavement and death of thousands. And I went on to say that while our needs are few and relatively simple, our wants in this incredibly affluent society are virtually endless. By meeting those wants, whatever they may be, we serve others, not always to their benefit, nor to our own, nor would I call those in drugs and pornography successful, nor do their riches amount to much if they're apprehended and sent to prison. But I did stop using that quotation. It is possible to get rich without enriching others. But for most of us, it's not the way we want to go. It's nothing to take pride in. Why bother when there are so many positive, excellent, and productive ways to serve others? But whatever our goal happens to be, if we stay with it, if we're fully committed to it, we'll reach it. That's the way it works. It's estimated that about 5% of the population achieves unusual success. For the rest, averages seem to be good enough. Most seem to just drift along, taking circumstances as they come, and perhaps hoping from time to time that things will get better. I like to compare human beings with ships, as Carlyle used to do. It's estimated that about 95% can be compared to ships without rudders, subject to every shift of wind and tide, they are helplessly adrift, and while they fondly hope that they will one day drift into some rich and bustling port, you and I know that for every narrow harbor entrance, there are a thousand miles of rocky coastline. The chances of their drifting into port are a thousand to one against them. Our state lotteries wax rich on such people. So do the slot machines at Las Vegas and Atlantic City. They look to luck, but don't seem to realize how steeply the odds are stacked against them. Someone wins from time to time, to be sure, but the odds are still there. But the 5% who have taken the time and exercised the discipline to climb into the driver's seat of their lives, who have decided upon a challenging goal to reach and fully committed themselves to reaching it, sail straight and far across the deep oceans of life, reaching one port after another and accomplishing more in just a few years than the rest accomplish in a lifetime. If you should visit a ship in port and ask the captain for his next port of call, he'll tell you in a single sentence. Even though the captain cannot see his port, his destination, for fully 99% of the voyage, he knows it's there, and that barring an unforeseen and highly unlikely catastrophe, he'll reach it. All he has to do is keep doing certain things every day. If someone asks you for your next port of call, your goal, could you tell him? Is your goal clean and concise in your mind? Do you have it written down? It's a good idea. We need reminding, reinforcement. If you can get a picture of your goal and stick it to your bathroom mirror, it's an excellent idea to do so. Thousands of successful people carry their goals written on a card in their wallets or purses. When we ask people what they're working for, chances are they'll answer in vague generalities. They might say, no oh, good health or happiness or lots of money. That's not good. Good health should be a universal goal. We all want that and do our best to achieve and maintain it. But happiness is a byproduct of something else, and lots of money is much too vague. It might work, but I think it's better to choose a particular sum of money. The better, the clearer our goal is defined, the more real it becomes to us, and before long, the more attainable. Happiness comes from the direction in which we're moving. For example, children are happier on Christmas morning, before opening their presents, than they are Christmas afternoon. No matter how wonderful their presents may be, it's after Christmas. They'll enjoy their gifts, to be sure, but we often find them querulous and irritable Christmas afternoon. We're happier on our way out to dinner than we are on the way home. We're happier going on vacation than we are coming home from it. And we're happier moving toward our goals than even after they've been accomplished, believe it or not. That's why it's so important to set new goals as soon as the current one is realized. And we should never stop this process. All the days of our lives, we should be engaged in moving toward earning, and looking forward to a new plateau on which to stand, a new goal to accomplish. If you, like so many millions of Americans, don't know what it is you want sufficiently to name as your primary goal, I recommend you make out a want list. Take a notepad. Go off by yourself and write down the things you'd really like to have very much, or do. 
One might be a beautiful new home or a trip around the world, a, a visit to some special country or place. You might be yearning for a sailboat or a motor yacht, or if you're an avid fisherman, you might want to go salmon fishing in Alaska or trout fishing in New Zealand. It might be a business of your own or a particular position with your company. It might be a certain income that will permit you to live the way you'd like to live, or, as I said earlier, a certain amount of money in good investments or in a savings account. How about a special make of car or an addition to your present home? Just write down everything you can think of that you would really like to see come about in your life. Then, when you've exhausted your wants, go over the list again and number the items in the order of their importance. Then make number one your present goal. Listen to this message often, as I hope you'll listen to all the messages until they become a habit knit way of thinking and doing things. Believe me, the system works. It works every time. Life plays no favorites. If anyone can succeed, and millions do, so can you. Of one thing you may be sure, you will become what you think about. If your thinking is circular and chaotic, your life will reflect that chaos. But if your thinking is orderly and clear, if you have a goal that's important for you to reach, then reach it. You will. One goal at a time. That's important. That's where most people unwittingly make their mistake. They don't concentrate on a single goal long enough to reach it before they're off on another track, then another, with the result that they achieve nothing, nothing but confusion and excuses. I started looking for the so-called secret of success when I was 12 years old. I read every book I could find on the subject. I studied psychology and sociology. I studied the great religions of the world, and I read the world's greatest philosophers. And all of a sudden, many years later, I realized that in the hundreds of lives I'd studied, in the countless books I'd read, a plain and simple truth had kept appearing. It's believed that no one can learn anything until he or she is ready for it, and apparently I was finally ready in my late twenties, to finally see for the first time the secret I had searched for so long. It was simply this. We become what we think about. You see, you are at this moment the living embodiment of the sum total of your thoughts to this point in your life. You can be nothing else. Similarly, five years from now, you'll be the sum total of your thoughts to that point in time. But you can control your thoughts you can decide upon that on which you wish to concentrate, about what you think about from this point forward, and you'll become that. You'll realize that goal as sure as anything on earth can be sure. That's why having a goal toward which to work is so very important. It gives our minds a focus and our lives direction. By thinking every morning, every night, and as many times during the day as you can about this exciting single goal we've established for ourselves, we actually begin moving toward it and bringing it toward us. When we concentrate our thinking, it's like taking a river that's twisting and turning and meandering all over the countryside and putting it into a straight, smooth channel. Now it has power, direction, economy, speed. Several billions of human beings would give anything they have to enjoy the freedom and personal liberty you and I take for granted, to have the right to choose their work and their goals, to enjoy our bountiful standard of living, our educational system to know the peace and privacy of our homes, and to have laws which protect the citizen rather than persecute him. We have it all. Yet in the midst of our plenty, millions lead unhappy, aimless lives. They live in tiny prisons of their own fashioning. These are the people who don't know that each of us, each one of us, not the economy, or fate, or luck, or the breaks, each one of us is in charge of his or her own life, each one of us is completely responsible. As Carlyle put it, the person without a purpose is like a ship without a rudder. Have a purpose in life, and having it, throw such strength of mind and muscle into your work as God has given you. He also said, a person with a half volition goes backward and forward and makes no way on the smoothest road. But the person with a whole volition advances on the roughest, and will reach his or her purpose if there be even a little wisdom in it. And Munger said, There is no road to success but through a clear, strong purpose. Nothing can take its place. A purpose underlies character, culture, position, attainment of every sort. So decide upon your goal, 
insist upon it. Look at your goal card every morning and night, and as many times during the day as you conveniently can. By so doing, you'll insinuate your goal into your subconscious mind. You'll see yourself as having already attained your goal, and do that every day without fail, and it will become a habit before you realize it. A habit that will take you from one success to another all the years of your life, for that is the secret of success, the door to everything you will ever have or be. You are now, and you most certainly will become, what you think about. All creatures at birth are supplied with everything they need for successful survival. All creatures except one are supplied with a set of instincts that will do the job for them, and because of that, they don't need much of a brain. Take the magnificent bald eagle, for example. My wife and I saw dozens of them on a recent fishing trip in Alaska. To see one of them come swooping down and pluck a live and sizable fish from the water on a single pass is astonishing. More astonishing still is the eagle's eyesight, and because of its need to see small rodents moving in the grass from high altitudes or a fish just inches under the surface of the water, its incredible eyes take up just about all of the space in its head. For the eagle, its eyes are the most important thing, and everything else works in unison with them. Its brain is tiny and rudimentary. It doesn't think or plan or remember. It simply acts in accordance with stimuli. And it's the same with most other living creatures. Even the beautiful porpoise with a much larger brain and the chimpanzee are easily tamed and taught. Only one takes 20 years to mature and has dominion over all the rest and the earth itself and has today the power to destroy all life on earth in a couple of hours. Only one is given the godlike power to fashion its own life according to the images it holds in its remarkable mind. Everything fashioned by human beings is a result of goal-setting. We reach our goals. That's how we know that the diseases that plague us will be conquered. We've set goals to eradicate every disease that plagues us, and eradicate them we will one by one. We have never set a goal that we have not reached, even landing on the moon, or are now in the process of reaching. No one ever made a purposeful accomplishment without a clear goal toward which to work. I hope you've established yours and that you've begun to think about it frequently every day to impress it into your mind, particularly your remarkable subconscious where forces greater than we can imagine can come to your aid. For a moment, consider the things your mind has brought you. Everything you have, your work, your relationship with your family and others, your philosophy of life all come to you as a result of using your mind, your religion. Now consider the estimate made by experts. You have probably been operating on less than 10% of your mental capacity, and probably much less than that. In an article for the Saturday Review, our old friend Herbert Otto, psychologist, educator, and chairman of the National Center for the Exploration of Human Potential, reminded us that many well-known scientists, such as the late Abraham Maslow, Margaret Mead, Gardner Murphy, O. Spurgeon English, and Carl Rogers, subscribe to the hypothesis that man is using a very small fraction of his capacities. Margaret Mead quotes a 6% figure. Herbert Otto writes, my own estimate is 5% or less. Neurological research has shed new light on man's potential. Work at the UCLA Brain Research Institute points to enormous abilities latent in everyone by suggesting an incredible hypothesis. They said the ultimate creative capacity of the human brain may be, for all practical purposes, infinite. To use the computer analogy, man is a vast storehouse of data, but we have not learned how to program ourselves to utilize these data for problem-solving purposes. The following appeared in Soviet Life Today, a USSR English-language magazine. 
It said the latest findings in anthropology, psychology, logic, and physiology show that the potential of the human mind is very great indeed. As soon as modern science gave us some understanding of the structure and work of the human brain, we were struck with its enormous reserve capacity, writes Yefremov, eminent Soviet scholar and writer. He continues, Man, under average conditions of work and life, uses only a small part of his thinking equipment. If we were able to force our brain to work at only half its capacity, we could, without any difficulty whatever, learn 40 languages, memorize the large Soviet encyclopedia from cover to cover, and complete the required courses of dozens of colleges. End of quote. That statement is hardly an exaggeration. It's the generally accepted theoretical view of man's mental potentials. Now, how can we tap this gigantic potential? It's a big and very complex problem with many ramifications. But as Herbert Otto points out, it's clear that persons who live close to their capacity, who continue to activate their potential, have a pronounced sense of well-being and considerable energy. They see themselves as leading purposeful and creative lives. The way most people use their minds can be compared to the time back in the early 19th century when just the eastern coast of the North American continent was settled, just a strip along the east coast. To the west stretched the raw, undeveloped great bulk of what was later to become the incredibly rich 90% of the economy. 90% which resulted in the standard of living enjoyed today by Americans. If everything you have is the result of using just 5% of your mind. Consider for a moment what it will mean to you and your family if you can increase this percentage. This cassette will show you how to use infinitely more of your mental powers, how to develop some of that more than 90% virgin territory. None of us, as a rule, has the slightest notion of the real capabilities of his or her mind, but believe me when I say that your mind can be compared to an undiscovered gold mine, and it makes no difference whether you're 17 or 70. Look at it this way. Your goal is in the future. Your problem is to bridge the gap which exists between where you now are and the goal you intend to reach. This is the problem to solve. Robert Seashore, then chairman of the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University, pointed out that successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. And there you have it. Living successfully, getting the things we want from life, is a matter of solving the problems which stand between where we now are and the point we wish to reach. No one is without problems. They're part of living. But let me show you how much time we waste in worrying about the wrong problems. Here's a reliable estimate of the things people worry about. Things that never happen... 40%. Things over and past that can never be changed by all the worry in the world, 30%. Needless worries about our health, 12%. Petty miscellaneous worries, 10%. Real, legitimate worries, 8%. In short, 92% of the average person's worries take up valuable time, cause painful stress, even mental anguish, and are absolutely unnecessary. And of the real, legitimate worries, there are two kinds. There are the problems we can solve, and there are the problems beyond our ability to personally solve. But most of our real problems usually fall into the first group, the ones we can solve if we learn how. There must be millions of people today who feel they're being barred from the life they want because they look upon problems not as challenges to be met, but as wide chasms beyond their ability to bridge. A little research proves that successful people have the same kinds of problems. One of the very real benefits of working with a psychologist or psychiatrist comes from learning that there are hundreds of thousands, even millions of other people, with problems identical to our own. So the whole thing boils down to a matter not of problems which are common to us all, but to our ability to solve them. Now I'm going to assume you've decided on a goal. Remember, you will become and you will achieve what you think about. That is, if you stay with it, you'll reach your goal. But how? It's right here that your mind comes into play. What is your mind, really? Nobody knows for sure. Perhaps the best way to describe it is to quote Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Archibald MacLeish. 
in his play, The Secret of Freedom, a character says, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. That's uncomfortably true. The human mind is the one thing that separates us from the rest of the creatures on earth. Everything that means anything to us comes to us through our minds, our love of our families, our beliefs, all of our talents, knowledge, abilities. Everything is reflected through our minds. Anything that comes to us in the future will almost certainly come to us as a result of the extent to which we use our minds. And yet it's the last place on earth the average person will turn to for help. Do you know why? You know why people don't automatically turn their own vast mental resources on when faced with a problem? It's because they never learned to think. Now that is a fact, believe it or not. Most people never think at all during the entire course of their lives. They remember, but that's not thinking creatively or in new directions. They react to stimuli, but again, that's not thinking. Remembering to set the alarm at night and getting up when it rings in the morning does not take thought nor does showering, shaving, getting dressed, eating breakfast, going to work. At work, we once again fall into comfortable routines. At quitting time, we go home and start repeating the process. Most people, let me say it again, do not know how to think. When they're faced with a problem, they will go to any length to avoid thinking. They will ask advice from the most illogical people, usually people who don't know any more than they do, next-door neighbors, members of their families. Very few of them have reference books, but much more important than that, only one in I don't know how many thousands will take a large notepad, write the problem at the top of the page, and then deliberately turn on his or her thinking apparatus. But some people do think. They do indeed. In order to reflect a moment on the human mind, consider what it's accomplished. As you do, realize that we are developing so rapidly that we've come further in the realm of progress in the past 50 years than in all the preceding 10,000 years of human civilization. Of all the scientists who ever lived, it's estimated that 90% of them are alive today. We've reached in the area of ideas and human advancement a plateau so high it was undreamed of by even the most optimistic forecasters as recently as 30 years ago. But every new idea triggers additional ideas so that now we're in an era of compounding advancement on every front and in every area that stagger the imagination. The harnessing of the power of the sun in our atomic plants and ships, the speed of light computers which in minutes save months and years of calculating drudgery, every man-made thing you see and touch spawned from the most powerful agency in the world, the human mind. Dr. Harlow Shapley of Harvard has said that we're now entering an entirely new age of man. He calls it the psychozoic age, the age of the mind. And you, my friend, own one, free and clear. Now let's look at a few facts. The 40-hour week long standard is in imminent likelihood of being even further shortened. This means that the average working person has at his disposal an enormous amount of free time. In fact, if you'll total the hours in a year and subtract the sleeping hours, if he or she sleeps eight hours every night, you'll find that this person has about 6,000 waking hours, of which less than 2,000 are spent on the job. Now, this leaves 4,000 hours a year when a person is either working or sleeping. These can be called discretionary hours, with which that person can do pretty much as he or she pleases. So that you can see the amazing results in your own life, I want to recommend that you take just one hour a day, five days a week, and devote this hour to exercising your mind. You don't even have to do it on weekends. Pick one hour a day on which you can fairly regularly count. The best time for me is an hour before the others are up in the morning. The mind's clear, the house is quiet, and if you like, with a fresh cup of coffee, this is the time to start the mind going. And here's one good way to do it. During this hour every day, take a completely blank sheet of paper. At the top of the page, write your present primary goal, clearly, simply. Then, since our future depends upon the way in which we handle our work, write down as many ideas as you can for improving that which you now do. Try to think of 20 possible ways in which the activity that fills your day can be improved. You won't always get 20, but even one idea is good. 
Now we remember two important points with regard to this. One, this is not particularly easy. And two, most of your ideas won't be any good. When I say it's not easy, I mean it's like starting any other habit. At first, you'll find your mind a little reluctant to be hauled up out of that old familiar bed. But as you think about your work and ways in which it might be improved, write down every idea that pops into your head, no matter how absurd it might seem. Let me tell you what'll happen. Some of your ideas will be good and worth testing. The most important thing, however, that this extra hour accomplishes is that it deeply embeds your goal into your subconscious mind, starts the whole vital machinery working the first thing every morning, and 20 ideas a day, if you can come up with that many, total 100 a week, even skipping weekends. An hour a day, five days a week, totals 260 hours a year and still leaves you 3,740 hours of free leisure time. Now, this means you'll be thinking about your goal and ways of improving your performance, increasing your service. Six and a half full extra working weeks a year. Six and a half 40-hour weeks devoted to thinking and planning. Can you see how easy it is to rise above that so-called competition? And it'll still leave you with seven hours a day to spend as you please. Starting each day thinking, you'll find that your mind will continue to work all day long, and you'll find that at odd moments when you least expect it, really great ideas will begin to bubble up from your subconscious. When they do, write them down as soon as you can. Just one great idea can completely revolutionize your work and, as a result, your life. If you want to develop the muscles of your body, you take daily exercise of some sort. The mind is developed in the same way except that the returns are out of all conceivable proportion to the time and energy spent. The mind of man can lift anything. His muscles, even the best developed, are puny alongside those of some of the dumbest animals on earth. If man had depended on his muscles for survival, he probably would have disappeared, as did the dinosaurs, which were, incidentally, the most physically powerful and most successful creatures that ever lived. Let me give you just some of the results people have reported to me as a consequence of following this one-hour-a-day routine. An office equipment salesman sold more of his company's product in one month than he informally sold in an entire year during the four years he'd been with his company. A Sunday school teacher with five pupils set a goal of 30 pupils. Her last letter told me she now has a class of 25. She's almost reached her goal. I've used this system for years, and it's given me some of the most gratifying and rewarding experiences of my life. And it costs only five hours a week, five hours out of 168. Is it worth it? It's like spending five hours a week digging in a solid vein of pure gold, because your mind is all of that and much more. Each time you write your goal at the top of the sheet of paper, don't worry or become concerned about it. Think of it as only waiting to be reached, a problem only waiting to be solved. Face it with faith and bend all the great powers of your mind toward solving it. And believe me, solve it you will. You know, this puts each of us in the driver's seat. Now let's briefly recap. 1. This week, start spending one hour a day getting as many ideas as you can. Try for 20 a day on ways to improve what you're now doing. Don't become discouraged. Remember the achievement of your goal very likely depends upon it, as does your whole future. Once you start exercising your mind in this way, I know you'll want to continue the practice. Two, if everything you now have is the result of using, say, 5 to 10 percent of your mental ability, you can imagine what life will be like if you can increase this figure to 20 percent or more. Three, successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. Four, don't waste time and energy worrying about needless things. Forty percent of them will never happen. Thirty percent have already happened and can't be changed. Twelve percent are needless worries about our health. Ten percent are petty miscellaneous worries, and only eight percent are genuine. Try to separate the real from the unnecessary and solve those which are within your ability to solve. Five, the human race has advanced farther during the past 50 years than in all the preceding 10,000 years of human civilization. We're now living right in the middle of the golden age man has been dreaming of and praying for for centuries, and it's going to get better. Last of all, 
The only thing in the world that can take you to your goals in life is your mind, its effective use, and following through on the good ideas it supplies you. Each of us has a tendency to underestimate his or her own abilities. We should realize that we have deep within ourselves deep reservoirs of great ability, even genius, that can be tapped if we'll just dig deep enough. It's the miracle of your mind. I'm sure you find it as amazing as do the rest of us that the great majority of people have to learn things the hard way. It's only natural to think that if a great discovery were made in a particular generation, all the succeeding generations would know about it and utilize it for their own good. But in many things, such is not the case. It's true with most inventions and discoveries which obviously affect our lives, but it frequently is not true when it comes to the great laws which determine the directions of our individual destinies. In one of the so-called third world countries, a group of laborers was hired to work on a farm. Now, these people came from a small, very remote village where motor vehicles were virtually unknown. They were enjoying the new experience of being transported on the back of a truck when they came to the place where they thought they were supposed to get off. Without giving it a thought, apparently, they just stepped off the back of the speeding truck. Fortunately, they fell on a soft dirt road, not a paved highway, but even so, the results of their unconventional method of disembarking were, to say the least, astonishing. At least to them, they went bounding, spinning, sliding, and cartwheeling along the dusty road for quite a distance before gravity and friction working together finally brought them to a halt. None was seriously injured. In fact, by the time the terrified driver got back to them, they were laughing uproariously about the whole thing. The truck driver, in explaining the incident, later put the blame on their never having ridden in trucks before. Now, that's the obvious answer, but it's really not the true one. The amazing circus tumbling act on a remote farm road had been caused by ignorance of a law, a law that operates the same whether a truck, a boat, an airplane, or any moving body is involved. Sir Isaac Newton gave us the law, and it goes like this. A body in motion tends to remain in motion until acted upon by an outside force. When the workers stepped off the back of the speeding truck, they were going the same speed as the truck itself. The outside force was gravity, which pulled them down to the road, still traveling at the same speed, and, well, you get the idea. They had been hurt, confused, frightened, and turned upside down because... They didn't understand the principal law on which everything in the universe operates, the laws of cause and effect. This law has been written thousands of times by the greatest minds the world has produced, and as a result has appeared in many forms. For our purposes, it might best be put this way. Our rewards in life will always match our service. It's another way of saying, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And it's been written in many ways in every language on earth. Sir Isaac Newton, in promulgating his laws of physics, put this one in this way. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. In saying our rewards in life will always match our service, you'll almost always get general agreement. People will nod their heads and say, yes, that's certainly true. Then they will go their ways and never realize, for the most part, how close they came to a truth so great and all-enveloping that their every thought and action is affected by it. I like to think of this law in the form of a giant apothecary scale, a kind with a cross arm from which hang two bowls on chains. Now, one of the bowls is marked rewards. The other is marked service. Whatever we put into the bowl marked service, the world will match in the bowl marked rewards. How we think, work, talk, and conduct ourselves is what we have to put in the bowl mark service, and the extent and nature of our service will determine our rewards. If any person alive is discontented with his rewards, he needs to examine his service. Action, reaction. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. What you put out 
will determine what you must get back in return. So simple, so basic, so true, and so misunderstood. If a business is not expanding to the quick and exciting tempo of the times, it must examine its contribution, its service. If a person is unhappy with his income, he must examine and reevaluate his service. Now, whom do we serve? Each of us serves a portion of humanity, and humanity to any given person is the people with whom he or she comes in contact. It's family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, customers, prospects, employer, all those he or she has chosen to serve. Everyone, everyone with whom we have any kind of contact is to us humanity, and to the extent that we serve, will our rewards be determined. Never before in the history of the world have human beings been so interdependent. It's as impossible to live without serving others as it would be to live if others were not constantly serving us, and this is good. The more closely knit this interdependence becomes, the greater will be human achievement. We need each other, and we literally cannot live without one another. Every time we strike a match, drink a glass of water, turn on the lights, pick up the phone, drive our car, put on our clothes, take a bath, mow the lawn, go fishing, try making your own fish hook sometime, we're being served by other human beings. Every time you look at your watch, you're being served by a great industry and by efforts of thousands of human beings. We all seek rewards, and we should understand that rewards come in two forms. There are tangible rewards, and intangible, that is. Rewards include the money we earn, the home we buy, the car we drive, the clothes we wear. But it also includes our happiness, our peace of mind, our inner satisfaction, the people we meet and enjoy. But remember this. Whatever it is you seek in the form of rewards, you must first earn in the form of service to others. All attempts to sidestep this law will end in failure, frustration, and, if maintained long enough, ultimate demoralization. We can see this frustration on every side. We can see it in the tense, strained, and nervous faces, in the mountains of tranquilizers which are consumed every day, and we can also see it in the slack, bovine-like faces of those who have found the whole game too complicated and have simply given up, surrendered to the push and pull of circumstances. How much of this do you suppose is due to misunderstanding or ignorance of the simple and wonderful law of nature? It's my belief that a great deal can be traced to this cause. Now, do you understand this law, fully understand it, intellectually and emotionally? If you do, you can chart a wonderful course through life. Just as the field worker stepped off a speeding truck, just as a child will put its fingers in the way of a closing door, just as a speeding driver discovers he's not going to make the curve, how many times have you been confounded because you acted contrary to the rules? Not just the rules of man, but the rules of nature. How many times have you been in the position of the man who sat in front of the empty fireplace and said, give me heat, and then I'll give you some wood? People seem to be divided into those who understand that the wood must be put in before they can expect warmth, and those who feel they should get warmth whether they do anything about it or not, or who feel they should get maximum heat from too small a supply of wood. A person's discontent can be said to be represented by the distance between what he or she has and what he or she wants. Once that which is wanted has been achieved, the odds are good that still more will be wanted because that's the way of people and that's good, that's a healthy sign. Constructive discontent is what gives us our continuing upward spiral of civilization. So do this, if you haven't already. Let's assume you've determined what it is you want. Look objectively at the place in which you now find yourself, consider the distance separating you from your goal, and determine ways of increasing your service so you'll build a bridge across it. This puts thinking and creative activity into living. It also assures us that our goals can be achieved by individual effort and in the shortest possible time. One morning I was having breakfast in a restaurant in Monterey, California, one of the most naturally beautiful places in the world. Suddenly I was aware of the young people sitting in the booth next to mine. It was obvious that they were very unhappy, and the young man, they couldn't have been over 25, was saying, well, I've tried everywhere, but no one wants to give me a job. I guess we'll have to go back home. It was apparent from their attitudes that they wanted to live on the Monterey Peninsula, but were about out of money and unable to find a job. But he had said, nobody wants to give me a job. 
He wanted someone to give him something, in this case a job. What might have happened if he had turned the whole idea around? What if he had said instead, What do I know how to do that will serve some of the people of this beautiful part of the world? Or how can I or we be of value to this community? The people here will be happy to supply us with the living we need if we can think of some way to serve them. If we can think of some way to serve them. What do they need or want that we can supply? Do they need a handyman, a first-class housekeeper, or both? Can we wash and wax cars right in their driveways, detail them so that they look like showroom display models? Let's buy a pad of paper and a ballpoint pen and start thinking of all the things we can do to earn a living here. It'll give us time to think of other ways, more profitable ways. But that wash and wax idea might grow into quite a service for the community. But let's don't stop there. Let's think of some more ways we can start right here to be of service to the people who live here. Right there in the restaurant, instead of being depressed and considering themselves failures, they could have come up with a dozen or so ways in which they could have remained on the Monterey Peninsula and built a fine business for themselves. They didn't need a job. They needed to think, but they had never thought before. It was as foreign to them as speaking Urdu. There they were, two fine, bright, good-looking young people, with a world of opportunity beckoning to them with two fine minds, and they were going to go back home. No one had ever told them about the gold mines they carried between their ears. Do you know how many people would have reacted the same way these young people had reacted? They are most of the people in the United States, or any other country for that matter. People will do everything in the world, even turn to crime, before they will think. George Bernard Shaw once commented, I've become rich and famous by thinking a couple of times a week. Most people never think at all. The young couple in Monterey, conscientious as they were, were not sowing, therefore they could not reap. They were putting nothing into the community, therefore they could expect nothing in return. To some this seems unfair, but it isn't. It's eminently and wonderfully and abundantly fair. Our job is to do the sowing. That's our department, that's all. The rest will take care of itself. We've been given the equipment free and clear. All we are asked to do is use it. Unfortunately, thinking is not taught in the public schools, or most of the private schools for that matter. Thinking is a subject, incredible as it may seem, that is totally ignored. A person's world can be compared to a plot of ground. It exists, it's there. It has inherent within itself an astonishing potential and is prepared to react to a person's every action. In fact, it must. Whatever your job happens to be, think of it for a moment as this plot of ground. In the beginning, there's nothing there but earth. If a person sits and watches it, nothing will happen to it. If a few seeds are tossed on it, the rain and the soil's natural fertility will combine to reward that person with a few results for limited efforts. Action, reaction. It all depends on just what's wanted from this plot of earth. It's what is wanted that must first be decided. Let's say what's wanted is a beautiful lawn bordered by flower gardens with a big tree in the shade of which he or she can sit one day and admire the work. So the areas for the garden are marked off. The soil is cultivated, smooth and cleaned of stones and trash. The lawn and flowers and the tree are planted. And from this point on, anyone observing this plot of land can evaluate in a second the amount of service, the contribution, this person is giving to the project. How can you tell? You can tell by seeing what the land is giving back to the person. Planting the plot is only the first step. We're given the plot, that's all we should be given. It's what we do with it that will determine its degree of greatness and success. It's like the story of the preacher who was driving by a beautiful farm. The fields were beautifully cultivated and abundant with well-cared-for crops. The fences, house, and barn were clean, neat, freshly painted. A row of fine trees led from the road to the house, where there were shaded lawns and flower beds. It was a beautiful sight to behold. So when the farmer working in the field got to the end of a row near the road, the preacher had stopped his car and hailed him, and he said, God has blessed you with a beautiful farm. And the farmer stopped and thought a moment, then he replied, Yes, sir, he has, and I'm grateful. But you should have seen this place when he had it all to himself. 
You see, the farmer understood that he had been blessed with a fine farm, but he was also aware that it was his own love and labor which had brought it to its present state. Each of us is given a plot to work, a lifetime, and the work we've chosen. Like the farmer, we'll be grateful if we have the vision, imagination, and intelligence to build well and successfully upon the seemingly unimpressive land of our beginnings. Or we can let it fall into a haphazard condition with no real continuity or purpose behind it, with unpainted ramshackle buildings surrounded by weeds and debris. It's the same land. It's what we do with it that makes the difference. The miracle is there, if only we're wise enough to see it and to realize that our fulfillment as persons depends upon our reaction to what we've been given. In thinking of ways of increasing your service, read books on your specialty. Read what others have found to work well for them. Listen to these tape cassette programs of ours. But at the same time, think of original and creative ways of increasing your service, ways that are unique with you and the way you are. Going at it strong for a week or a month and then falling back into old habits is just like working for a week or a month on that plot of ground and then abandoning it. Before long, it'll be no better than before. Each morning and during the day, ask yourself this question. How can I increase my service today, knowing that my rewards in life must be in exact proportion to my service? Now do this every day, and you'll have started to form one of life's most valuable habits. Horace Mann wrote, If any man seeks for greatness, let him forget greatness and ask for truth, and he'll find both. You see, you can cut away all the confusion and complications and nagging worries and vague half-formed fears by returning to the great truths, the great laws, the great verities on which all success, all accomplishment, in which the whole world is built. Drive down any street in the country, any street in any neighborhood, or farm community, any street at all, and you can quickly see what the people on that street are doing for the good of the community by observing what the community is doing for them. Have you ever looked at it that way? We can tell by looking at a place of business what it's doing for the community by observing what the community has done for the place of business. Is it thriving and growing, or is it just holding its own, or soon to go out of business? Whatever the situation, it's a reflection of its service, how well its service, whatever it may be, is being accepted by the people. Is it meeting their needs and wants? It's the same with families and their places of residence. That's why I said you could drive down any street. Some streets are lined with beautiful, expensive homes, while some neighborhoods are obviously suffering from poverty, ramshackle, with weeds growing in the yards, tin cans and rubble strewn everywhere, rusted cars. It's a reflection of what the people living in those homes, beautiful and expensive, or run down and filthy, are doing for them and for the community. That's it. It's always been a matter of interest to me that in neighborhoods with high unemployment, the people there don't seem to have enough time to keep their homes and yards tidy. While those working the hardest, while those doing the most, have the cleanest, most attractive homes with well-manicured lawns and flower gardens. Environment is a mirror of the people in that neighborhood. Change the people, and the environment will change accordingly. It reminds me of the old saying, What you are, speak so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. One day, a man was watching a professional football game on television. His five-year-old son kept bothering him, so he took a page of the Sunday paper with a full-page airline ad on it showing a picture of the world, the planet Earth as seen from space. He tore the page up into a dozen pieces and gave them to his son. He said, here, put this together with this cellophane tape and show Daddy how smart you are. Then he went back to watching his football game. Well, in a surprisingly short time, the youngster had the picture all taped back together. It wasn't very neat, but it was a very good job indeed for one so young. Hey, that's amazing, the father said. How did you put that world together so quickly? And the little boy said, There was a picture of a man on the other side. I just put the man together, and then the world was all together. The youngster was no doubt surprised by the big warm hug he got. That's right, son, the father said. When the man's all together... His world is altogether too. Being together is understanding how things work, 
Working hard won't do it. That isn't enough. We have to work intelligently. How often have we heard someone say, my father worked hard all his life but never had anything to show for it? It's another way of saying, my father, may he rest in peace, never quite figured out how things work. He worked hard all his life, but it was a job with very limited service. Or in another case, it goes like this. My father was a very bright person, but he kept jumping from one thing to another. He was always looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but he never stayed with one thing long enough to work it out. Succeeding takes time. It takes dedication, a hundred percent commitment and creative thought. We must keep asking ourselves, how can I broaden my service and by so doing, increase my harvest, my rewards? All right, how can we correct the situation? William James gave us the answer. He wrote, either some unusual stimulus fills them with emotional excitement, or some unusual idea of necessity induces them to make an extra effort of will. Excitements, ideas, and efforts, in a word, are what carry us over the dam. All right, let your goal represent the excitement. Your ideas and efforts will weigh down the service end of the scale, and the rewards must and will follow. They'll be yours. They are yours the moment you realize the truth. As ye sow, so shall ye reap all the years of your life. If you're worried about your income or your future, you're concentrating on the wrong end of the scale. Look at the other end. Concern yourself only with increasing your service, with becoming great where you are, and your income and your future will take care of themselves. Don't be the person sitting in front of that empty fireplace and asking for heat. You're asking for the impossible. Pile in the wood first, and the heat will come as a result. Next time you're off by yourself in a quiet place, contemplate your plot of ground, your life, and begin to sow the seeds which will yield you a rich and abundant harvest. In William James' essay on vital reserves, he wrote, Compared with what we ought to be, we're only half awake. Our fires are damped, our drafts are checked. We're making use of only a small part of our possible mental and physical resources. Stating the thing broadly, he went on to write, The human individual thus lives usually far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. He energizes below his maximum, and he behaves below his optimum. It is our intention that each of these messages be built upon a major principle, one of the great ideas which automatically produces the results we seek. In this message, let's talk about a principle that never fails. Following this particular idea gives quality and richness to life. It will also produce a peace of mind that never wavers, and the principle is integrity. Like other great ideas, it gets a lot of lip service, but it's seldom a true way of life. How people love and value a person of integrity. Integrity in everything we do, in all of our relationships with others. Integrity in what we say. Integrity in our work. But the word integrity often conjures up a person of stern and sober visage who walks the straight and narrow. That's not the kind of integrity I'm talking about. I'm talking about integrity with a sense of humor. Integrity with understanding. Integrity with kindness and gentleness but integrity all the same. Never expediency. Never saying, well, everybody else is doing it. I guess it won't hurt if I do it too. But it does hurt. If it's wrong, and we know it's wrong, it does hurt. The seed for achievement is integrity. Integrity means honesty and the truth. Perhaps it was best put in the famous line by Shakespeare when in Hamlet he has Polonius say, and this above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. If we're true to ourselves, we cannot be false to anyone else. If our word to live by is integrity, we have what we need in a pinch. Our sleep is untroubled, and we're respected wherever we go. 
During the Korean War, the Chinese communists overran an American position and captured an American general. He was subjected to weeks of the worst kind of treatment, brainwashing and questioning. He never gave in. Finally, he was told that unless he answered their questions, he would be executed the following morning. That night, he wrote a letter to his wife. And at the end of the letter, he said, Tell Johnny the word is integrity. As it turned out, he was not executed, and he was later repatriated to American forces. But thinking he was going to die, he told his son that the word is integrity. Integrity means to try as best we can to know ourselves, to examine ourselves as Socrates advised, and make a true assessment of ourselves, an inventory of our abilities, our talents, what we want, our goals. Not long ago, I received a letter from Scott D. Palmer, in which he said, I came across some advice about happiness from my mentor, Dr. Brand Blanchard, that I published in my newsletter some time back. Blanchard is one of the greatest men of our century, even though few people have ever heard of him. He celebrated his 93rd birthday last year with the publication of his latest book, Four Reasonable Men, a biographical book on Marcus Aurelius, Ernest Renan, John Stuart Mill, and Henry Sidgwick. Appropriate for Blanchard, the key virtue that leads to all the others is reasonableness. Brand Blanchard is Sterling Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Yale University, and on the subject of happiness he wrote, 1. It is important to happiness not to think too much about it. The person who continually asks himself if he's happy is apt to miss his end, for happiness, as Aristotle thought, is a byproduct of healthful and successful activity. Bertrand Russell, who wrote The Conquest of Happiness, remarked that scientists are generally happier than artists, since they're commonly lost in objective tasks and not examining their own navels. What is important is to find what one can do best, generally also the line most useful to others, and then to do it with all one's might. Happiness will come unsought. If one seeks it directly, one will be like the discontented old ladies who haunt Miami hotels. Number two, the main principle of my ethics is, Brand Blanchard writes, to act as to make the world as much better as possible. I've not lived up to it. No one has. There I disagree with Dr. Blanchard. He has made the world better and so have many others. But trying to live up to it, he writes, involves constantly looking forward to the consequences of one's actions, choosing those that are likely to be fruitful and inhibiting action from impulse. Many people think, of course, that acting on impulse is a requirement of happiness, and I agree that impulse must be there, the stronger the better, provided it's under control. But seeking happiness directly by blindly following one's impulses is too likely to end in hippiedom, drugs in the gutter. And the distinguished Yale professor wrote, The most important thing I've learned is the necessity of reasonableness. The person who has the least to regret, who does most for his community, whose judgment carries the most weight and is the most trusted, is the person who is steadfastly and on principle reasonable. I don't mean the intellectual who is often an impractical bore. I mean the person who in matters of belief and matters of action takes as his principle, adjust your belief or decision to the evidence. And he completes his small essay on happiness by writing, There's no one meaning of life. No two lives have the same value. The richness of a life depends not on the amount of happiness it achieves, but on finding out who one is, that is, about one's unique combination of powers, and then discovering through experiment and reflection what course of life will fulfill those powers most completely? End of quote. You'll never get better advice. I agree with Scott Palmer that Brand Blanchard, Sterling Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Yale University, in his 93 years, most of them devoted to study and teaching and observing the human species, knows what he's talking about. And to me, reasonableness is another word for integrity. Integrity to truth, to the evidence no matter where it leads. And I especially like his saying, the richness of a life depends not on the amount of happiness it achieves, but on finding out who one is 
that is, about one's unique combination of powers, and then discovering through experiment and reflection what course of life will fulfill those powers most completely. What are your powers? There's something, probably several things, that you can do especially well, that you most enjoy doing, and which will automatically provide the greatest service to others. Are you ready to discover through experiment and reflection what course of life will fulfill those powers most completely? Now that's being true to yourself. That's integrity. That's reasonableness. As a radio listener wrote to me one day, there's little we cannot accomplish as persons if we manage the conquest of inner space. Being truthful with ourselves means taking the responsibility of making the best use of what we have and what do we have. We have our underutilized minds, our abilities, our talents, and time. These are our possessions. This is really an immense amount of wealth that belongs to each of us. And it's the investment of our wealth which will determine our rate of return. Our mind, our abilities, our talents, and time. No one can take those away from us. We take them with us wherever we go, and they represent our true wealth. That's what makes the human being autonomous, although most people don't know it. They remind me of the horse or elephant that meekly does what it's told or directed to do. It's completely unaware of its own strength. It doesn't know how easily it can do what it wants to do, and millions of miraculous human creatures live in tiny prisons of their own fashioning, completely unaware of their powers to be free, to do what they would most love to do, and in so doing, reap a harvest beyond their wildest imaginings. They are slaves to their ignorance, and follow each other around and around like so many processionary caterpillars. How have they invested their wealth, their minds, their abilities, their talents, and time? They're not even aware of it. As with the ownership of wealth of any kind, it's left to us to decide what use we'll make of it. We can squander it until it's gone, spend it in a helter-skelter, hit or miss fashion without much purpose or meaning, or we can invest it with intelligence and purpose and receive an abundant return, a return which will more than provide for our families all the years of our lives. The choice is ours, and it's here that integrity comes into the picture, for we're the only ones from whom we can steal time, talent, ability, and the use of our minds. It's making the best use of what we have, what we are, in the time that's been granted us. Sound simple? Well, truth is always simple and uncomplicated. As soon as we properly invest our true wealth, we place ourselves above competition. We're no longer competing, we're creating. We're understanding something that the great majority of people have never known. Here is the foundation upon which every great career has been built in every field. So invest in that yellow legal pad and a few ballpoint pens, and in your own best quiet time, start making notes. Here are some givens in the success department. Success has nothing at all to do with the size of the brain. The largest brain on record was the brain of an idiot. The smallest, the brain of Anatole France, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1921. Some of the world's greatest people in every field are or were short, bald, and fat, some tall and skinny, some were brilliantly educated, some had little or no schooling. The person destined for greatness is the person who decides for himself to follow his or her strongest suit. But truly successful people all have one thing in common. They all follow, consciously or unconsciously, the law of cause and effect. They are true to themselves. Although most people will give lip service to the idea of integrity, they're really not at all sure about it. With a great majority, it's often a matter of expediency. If it's expedient to be honest, fine, they're honest. If it's more expedient to realize a quick profit in some way by not disclosing the whole truth or by shading it a bit, well, let's shade it a bit. They tend to live on the basis of short-term or even instant gratification. They don't see succeeding as a long-range program. They don't know about what I like to call the unfailing boomerang. Every time a person does something dishonest, whether it's small or large, whether it's stealing a pair of pliers from the plant or embezzling $10,000, he's throwing the boomerang. It's the same with small dishonesties, with manipulating the truth. How far the boomerang will travel, no one can tell. Or how great or small a circle it will traverse, only time will tell. But it will eventually, inevitably, come around full circle and deliver its never-failing and painful blow. Honesty, unfailing integrity, 
is good business. In fact, Mirabeau wrote, if honesty did not exist, we ought to invent it as the best means of getting rich. Did you know that? Well, believe me, it's absolutely true. And all we have to do, under every circumstance, is ask ourselves, is this true? Is this honest? Is this the best I can do? And if it is, go ahead with the happy realization that we've put in motion the right cause and know that the effect will take care of itself. Our only hope of real success, of winning the hearts and minds of the people we serve, is in helping them in some way and thus improving their standard of living. But if we're content to give less than our best, we're actually working against ourselves. The average working person in our society is paid for about 40 hours a week. This leaves 120 hours a week to do as we please. Never before in the history of humankind have we had so much free time. That's 120 hours a week if we sleep eight hours every night, three times as much time as we spend on the job. How much is all that time worth? We want our leisure time, of course, time to relax, take it easy, recharge our batteries. But do we need 120 hours for that? Our greatest enemy has never changed, and his name is ignorance. And the greatest ignorance of all is the mistaken belief that we can ever receive more than we truly earn. Sooner or later, there will be an accounting. Every day, for good or bad, we're throwing the boomerang, and just as the punishment always seems to be greater than the offense, the rewards are also out of all proportion to our honest efforts. So let's summarize. What do we mean by integrity? It means giving everything we do our very best. It means being true to ourselves and to every other person with whom we come in contact. This gives meaning and comfort to our leisure time. Our rest has been earned. We know we'll move ahead toward our goals simply because we've become remarkable people. We cannot go unnoticed. The person of integrity is always needed in every undertaking. It means the willingness to keep an open mind, to look for truth wherever it leads all the years of our lives, to check things out for ourselves, to weigh what others tell us and make our own judgments. It's knowing that there's always a better way to do everything, and then a better way still to do that. It's looking for that better way in everything we do. It's realizing that the person who does not read is no better off than the person who cannot read, and that a person who does not continue to learn and grow as a person is no better off than one who cannot. It means that we must walk with integrity every day of our lives if we're to truly reap the abundant harvest all the years of our lives. It's realizing that the greatest joy a human being can experience is the joy of accomplishment. Remember to think of your life as that plot of rich soil waiting to be seeded. It can only return to you that which you sow. And what do you have to sow? You have great wealth. You have a mind that you can think. You have many abilities. You have talents that you still may not have explored. And you have time. Time which cannot be saved, stopped, nor held back for a second. Make full use of these riches. It's never too late. Use truth as your guide, integrity as your banner, and your plot of ground will return to you and yours an abundance that will amaze and delight you. And if days come in which you find yourself depressed or confused, remember this comment by Dean Briggs. He wrote, Do your work, not just your work and no more, but a little more for the lavishing sake, that little more which is worth all the rest. And if you suffer as you must, and if you doubt as you must, do your work. Put your heart into it and the sky will clear. And then out of your very doubt and suffering will be born the supreme joy of life. All kinds of studies have been made with regard to factors which motivate people to live as they do. We've already covered enough ground in this program to establish the fact that people are responsible for their personal lives, barring some act of God or government, catastrophe or war that might intervene to change things, permanently or temporarily. For example, a lot of my friends, many of them very good friends of mine, were killed during World War II when they were in their 20s and 30s. The lives of others have been unalterably modified by injury or serious illness. 
But for most of us, we have our health, which is the natural inclination of all nature, and we have our lives to live. Sometimes, believe it or not, that's a personal handicap. It often takes the physically handicapped to demonstrate for us the unlimited possibilities that exist as an option for those willing to set goals and stay with them until they're achieved. While the healthy among us often take the path of least resistance, I think it was Bill Veck when he had the Chicago White Sox who said, I don't want the natural athlete. I want a guy who'll go after the hard ones. It's the people in this world willing to go after the hard ones who achieve greatness. They're motivated. There's that word again. They're motivated to give the last ounce of themselves in the achievement of their goals. Now let's look at some facts of life. Only about 5% of the people achieve unusual success during their lives. These are the people who earn larger incomes, live in better neighborhoods, in better, larger homes, have better education, more of the good things of life, and make a correspondingly larger contribution to their communities. They tend to speak better English and send their kids to better schools. There are always exceptions to any rule, and there are many exceptions to this 5% group. I know a man who's head of one of the largest, best-known companies in the United States who can hardly put ten words together in their proper order. If murdering the English language were a misdemeanor, he'd be on death row. Yet he has mansions, yachts, private jets, the works. Why, with no more than perhaps a sixth-grade education and the apparent determination to assiduously avoid any improvement to it, has this man and his family enjoyed such spectacular financial success? Answer. He knows how to serve the people. His organization serves millions of people every day of the week. He's worked hard all of his life to build the great organization he heads, and he's done a fine job of it. So he can buy $3 million yachts and pay cash for them. And when he wants to go someplace in a hurry, there's his Gulf Stream 3 warmed up and ready for him when his chauffeur takes him to the airport. But most people in that top 5% fit the earlier description. Many of them are not rich by the standards of our mega-millionaire friend, but they're in the top 5% of American incomes. They're set for life, and they, as a group, tend to enjoy themselves very much. They play a better game of golf or tennis than most of the country's hackers, and they love their lifestyles. Now, a child is born in the United States. The odds, because of the statistics we've been talking about, are 95 to 5 that he will not be born into this top 5%. Like most children, he'll soon take his environment for granted. Let's assume he's a boy, although it works the same way for a girl. It will save my having to say he or she all the way through this interesting example. He grows up accepting his environment, his world, and his world is his environment as it is. Without giving it a single thought, his environment becomes a natural part of him. Everything about his environment is a conditioning factor. The speech of his parents and relatives and neighbors becomes his speech. What he learns in school will have very little effect on it. That's why you hear grown-up men and women who've gone through the American school system saying such things as ain't and where's it at. They didn't learn those locutions in school. They were the habitual pattern of speech they heard in their environment. I know an attorney who still says where's it at. Anyone's speech habits are an immediate tip-off as to his upbringing. The only reason mine tend to be rather good is because from the time I was a small child, I wanted to be a writer, and words were of great interest to me. Words are the tools of a writer's trade, and a good writer will have a decent inventory of them and tend to keep them well-oiled and shining. I was the only person in our family so affected. The rest had other interests, education not being one of them. If the statistics were reversed, it would be wonderful. If 95% of the people were successful to the degree the 5% are, the odds of a child being raised by the right group would be reversed, but that's not the case. So our typical young man or young woman grows up to mirror his or her environment. He thinks as they think. He takes that life for granted. All the people he loves are in that group. It's his group, too. And if he doesn't come across some unusual motivation along the way, he'll become an indistinguishable part of it. He does that because it's the perfectly natural thing to do. Their goals, or the lack of them, become his goals. A nice house on a nice street, a steady job of some kind, a good steady income, a good wife and good kids, and so the story goes. He operates on minimums all the years of his life. He never, except while playing his sports or getting ready for a date as a young man, gets out of low gear. 
It isn't necessary in the United States. This country is so affluent, so vital, and so perennially booming that people don't have to shift into second or third gear in order to meet average requirements. And neither do most of the people throughout the world. Nor should they have to if they don't want to. His wife, while their children are small, is the hardest working human being in our society. She has no eight-hour day or five-day-a-week system. She works 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and according to a recent survey, if she had to do it all over again, she'd think twice about it. More than 50% of her number also hold down a regular paying job. She didn't know about the 5% either. No one ever said to this young man or this young woman, Now look here. There are two very distinct groups of people in our society. They're in different layers of this socio-economic pyramid. And here, the parent or teacher would have sketched a pyramid. Now there's the top 5% who live and work in this top section here. And the person would have drawn a line under what represents the top 5% of the pyramid. Now here's what we call the great middle class in America. It's divided into two main groups. The upper middle class, another line would be drawn on the pyramid, and the lower middle class. The United States has the largest middle class of any country in the world. And then down here at the bottom, these few lower layers, these are the people who, because of a thousand perfectly good reasons, need to be helped by all the rest of us. They have difficulty coping. Many of them are too old or sick to help themselves. We have some 25 million functional illiterates and so on. So these young people would see very clearly their options. It would be made clear to them that they have the freedom, thank God and our forefathers, to choose. They have the option, if they so choose, to live and work on virtually any layer of that pyramid. And it should be pointed out to them that the higher up on that pyramid you climb, the better the view, the fresher the air, the smaller the crowd. Now that's important to know. But it takes more effort to climb higher on a pyramid. It's much easier to settle for these lower layers. You don't have to learn so much, and so on. Now, the parent or teacher might continue, we live right here at this level on the pyramid. And then the parent or teacher might say, it's not in the higher levels, but it's certainly not in the lower levels either. It's where I wanted to be. Your mother and I have been quite happy here. Well, I hope you get the picture. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we would be shown that when we're about 12 or 13? Wouldn't it be great to know... We had that option, and to see that pyramid. Well, this program is for the people who want to be in the top 5%, and it has a great deal of what we need to know to get into and stay in the top 5%. And while getting into the top 5% may be one's goal, it's good to remember that like any destination on planet Earth, there are a million ways to get there. Any road will do, any calling will do, if we go about it the right way. You can get rich hauling garbage, and many have already done so. It's a vital service to the community, but you have to go about it in a certain way. This young man, and now that we've brought his wife into the picture, this fine young woman, because of their past environment, their conditioning, come under the statistics of average Americans, because they live their lives in an average way. But of course, they're not really average people. With the right motivation, they could become very uncommon people and do very uncommon things. They could render much greater service to their community and reap a much more abundant harvest as a result, if they knew what we're talking about on this program. Now, what are the odds that they will ever come across Dr. Brand Blanchard's advice about happiness? Do they know what happiness is and where it comes from? Has either of them ever truly explored his and her potential strong point? What is it that your original genetic pattern makes you especially qualified to do, young man and young woman? What do you most want to do? What brings you the greatest joy? Do you know your rewards all the years of your life will be determined by the extent of your contribution, your service to others? Do you know why some people are paid $20,000 a week while others are paid the minimum wage? Bill Cosby earned $12 million in 1986. Do you know why? It's because of the people he serves. There's an investment banker in Los Angeles who earns about $40 million a year. Do you know that as far as he's known, there's no limit on earnings? What would you like to earn? How about a 1000 a week? That's 52000 a year, or twice that. 
That's not all there is to living by any means, far from it, but it does pay the bills. And if you earn an income in the upper 5% of the population, there you are, in that top 5% of the pyramid that the sun hits first as the earth does its daily rollover act. And the sun is still shining on it later in the day when the rest of the plane is dark. It's nice up there. And shooting for it will bring out the best that's in you. You'll do more for others. You'll make a greater contribution. You'll give more to charities. You'll help more people. So how about it? There's a talk I'd like to give to young people. Some would say I'd stir discontent among them, but I would reply that discontent is the greatest motivator of them all, and it's responsible for every great boon to humankind, from running water in the inside toilet to the supermarket. A little discontent is a good thing, especially when it's discontent with ourselves. The effect of environment is an incalculably powerful force. The deepest craving of young people is to be liked by their fellow students. Acceptance and esteem in the eyes of their contemporaries is their deepest craving. So they begin to do what the other kids are doing, and the other kids begin doing what they're doing, and everyone acts just like everyone else. They dress alike. They talk alike. They laugh at the same things, even when it isn't funny. It's at this critical age that they begin to play, not follow the leader. That'd be all right. The game they play is called follow the follower. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, these young, wonderful, impressionable people conform to one another. They never ask, are the people to whom I'm conforming qualified to lead me? It's belonging that's important. Belonging to the group. And that's the subtle trap that gets practically everybody. If we don't break out of that trap sooner or later, we'll end in it. Millions, no billions do. It's astonishing how many adults never break out. We see them in their 50s and 60s, still playing to the wrong crowd, still trying to be one of the boys. Do you remember what Willie Loman said in Arthur Miller's great play, Death of a Salesman? He said, the important thing is to be liked. Willie Loman never grew up. He never knew who he was. His story is a modern tragedy. It's always been a tragedy. It's the story of the mob. That's why so many young, healthy women are smoking today. It's their way of going counter to what they know is the intelligent thing to do. It's their small and very pitiful rebellion. When a person has no identity of his or her own, that person will seek to find that identity in a larger group. That's why joining groups of various kinds is so popular. In that way, we get a badge, a label that tells us what we are. Now we're properly labeled. This is not to say that successful men and women do not belong to organizations. They certainly do, and they make major contributions to their organizations. But they don't need the organization for identity. They're quite aware of who and what they are. And if their organizations did not exist, they would be successful, independent performers in society. They would never feel lost. Successful people follow independent paths. This is the important point to remember. At some point in their lives, they break away from the crowd and start on a path of their own. That's the adult, the intelligent thing for a human creature to do. In striking off on an independent path, they're not necessarily alone. It's just that they join a much smaller group of like-minded people. They can't take the whole crowd into that top 5%. The ancient Romans had their circus. Modern Americans have their television. It's far superior to the old Roman circus, and they don't even have to leave the comfort of their living rooms. It's true that there are many wonderful things on television, and an eclectic approach, that is, selecting those programs in which you're really interested, makes sense. But millions of families have the television sets on all day. They're mesmerized by it. And when one thinks of what they could be doing with some of that time, it makes one realize that it's much easier to win. One of the best things about getting in that top 5% is that as we get older, life need not become less interesting for us or more laborious. We become more productive as we approach our 60s and 70s and often many years beyond. And it's nice to grow older with all the goodies of life. It's more comfortable. One can spend one's winters in Florida or somewhere south of the equator and one's summers in the cooler, healthier climates. And one can enjoy all the benefits of the good life. 
But perhaps most importantly of all, one can say, I gave it my best, and I'm not through yet. It's been a wonderful experience, this, this holiday on Earth, and I've enjoyed it very, very much. Now let's see what we can do with the rest of it. Yes, I think it's actually easier to win. There's less competition up there where the view is so much better and the air is so fresh and clean. And it's almost never too late. For with a purpose, a worthy goal, and the motivation to reach those upper layers on the pyramid, a person can travel farther in a few years than he might otherwise travel in a lifetime. Like most writers, when I see something I wrote ten years ago, I invariably see ways it could have been improved. I didn't see those possibilities ten years ago, but it's easier to see them today. It means I've grown as a writer, that I'm better, that I'm a more effective writer today than I was ten years ago. I'm worth more today, and if I continue as I have been doing, I'll be much better and worth a lot more ten years from now. Before the atomic age, chemistry professors used to say that a person's worth from a strictly chemical standpoint, was about $32 on the going market. In recent years, this view has undergone a startling change. Scientists now calculate that if the electronic energy in the hydrogen atoms of your body could be utilized, you could supply all the electrical needs of a large, highly industrialized country for nearly a week. A DuPont scientist said that the atoms of your body contain a potential energy of more than 11 million kilowatt hours per pound, the average person, by this estimate, is worth about $85 billion. Moreover, the electrons in the atoms of your body are not just particles of matter, they're waves of living energy, and these waves ripple out and spread themselves in patterns of light, and as they move, they sing. If you had the proper hearing aid, you could hear a great flow merging with the waves of neighboring atoms, and they not only sing, they shine. If you stand in front of an infrared television camera in a completely dark room, the screen will show you from top to toe as a glistening, radiating, gleaming form. In short, you're a whole lot more than meets the casual eye. Add to all this the fact that to try to reproduce your mind mechanically would cost many billions of dollars, and you begin to see yourself for what you really are, an amazing, infinitely valuable creature. And not only are you immensely valuable as a human being, you're unlike any other human being who ever lived or ever will live. You are unique. Now, what are you selling all this for? All human beings are priceless, but the payments, tangible and intangible, they receive from life vary greatly. The purpose of this message is to help you decide just what you are worth as a human being right now on the market in today's society and what you intend to be worth, say, oh, five years from now. In the last analysis, every person is in reality in business for himself or herself in that they're building their own lives regardless of who happens to write their paycheck. So for the purpose of this particular message, I'd like you to think of yourself as a business. Let's say a corporation. You hold the office of president of this corporation and that you're responsible for its success or failure. You and the members of your family are stockholders in your corporation, and it's your responsibility to see that the value of the stock increases in the years ahead. Your family has evidenced faith in you, and it's your responsibility to prove their faith is justified. This is the job of any employed family member. Now, while the operations of a corporation are multitudinous and complex, they can be reduced to four basic functions. Number one, finance. Two, production. Three, sales. Four, research. Without proper financing, there'd be no production. Without production, the company would have nothing to sell. Without sales, it would have to completely stop production. Without research, it could not hope to keep abreast or ahead of our rapidly changing times. Now, slight any one of these four vital functions and you have a deformed, a crippled company and if you slide it long enough, you'll commit corporate suicide. 
unless you want to cop out for that average business. We discussed finance, the money part of the whole thing, on another cassette. For now, let's concentrate on research, production, and sales. They are the head, hands, and legs of a company. We could say that the head handles research, the hands take care of production, and the legs handle sales. Cut off any one of these parts and you're left with a shocked, staggering organization. How many once large companies and trade names can you think of which became giants and then disappeared entirely from the economic scene? Names which once were world leaders in their fields and are now only memories. They failed to keep in balance these four crucial functions. What about research for your personal corporation? Research can be said to exist in two areas, present and future. That is, the research of a company should be devoted to ways and means of improving its present products or services, present production, and present sales. Future research is concerned with ways and means of developing new products and services, new methods of production, and new methods of marketing. But while this research is going on, present production must continue at as high a level as sales warrant. In short, a corporation, your corporation, has two factors to consider, the present and the future. How successful we are in meeting these challenges will determine our present profits and our future growth. Now, why are all companies concerned with growth, even when they seem to be doing well today? It's because of a law which operates with companies just as it does with human beings. Nothing in the world stands still. Nothing in the entire universe stands still. A law of physics goes a body in motion tends to remain in motion until acted upon by an outside force. A company which is growing has a tendency to continue to grow. In other words, it's doing things right. Conversely, a company which is going backwards or shrinking has a tendency to continue to go backwards or shrink until acted upon by an outside force. All responsible company officers know that unless a company is growing, it's developing the first signs of death. Well, you're the head of your personal corporation, and you should realize that this same law applies to you as well. Now, just for a minute, let's take a look at the next 10 years. Before we do, keep this in mind. If anyone had predicted just 10 years ago that we would be living in the kind of world we have today, he would have been ridiculed. Now, this includes everything from our basic industrial technology to the luxuries and new products we take for granted, along with our present average income. We're reaching a point in the expansion of human knowledge where our advance is more than dynamic, it's explosive. Any prediction for the next 10 years is very likely to be far on the ultra-conservative side, but let's take a look at what the experts have to say. According to many recent research studies, the next 10 years are going to offer business and the individual unlimited rewards. In the next 8 to 10 years, the bulk of spending in the highly developed nations will be for things, products, and services over and above the necessities, far above them, the necessities which are food, clothing, shelter, transportation, and medical care. Imagine most of the spending will be for things above and beyond the necessities. This will be the first time this has happened in the entire history of the human race. It's estimated the consumer market will expand 50% and more in the next generation or so, an astonishing increase soaring into the hundreds of billions of dollars. In the next 30 years, alongside every building now in existence, a new building must be built. And what about research and development, which is the future of our economy? Today, more money is being spent on R&D in a single year than was spent during the past 150 years. Think a moment. What does all this mean to you and your own individual company, the one of which you are the president? It means your future is unlimited, if you'll see yourself in relation to the present and the future. Never before throughout all the centuries of man has a person faced as bright a future as yours. Our population, too, is getting a lot smarter. Educational advances during the past 30 years have been remarkable. During the next 30, they'll probably be amazing. The customer is getting smarter every day. And if we're going to continue to meet his or her demands and sell him or her our products, we better get smarter every day, too. The market of the next 10 years will be characterized by diversity, not uniformity. It will also be dominated by taste, not necessity. There will be a great increase in the quality as well as the quantity of consumer choices. There are many signs of the rising urge for the better things in life. Many millions of adults are currently interested in after-hour study programs, and this number is growing by millions each year. 
Well, that's just a glance at a few of the things going on around us and what life will be like in eight to ten years. Now, each of us, as president and unquestioned manager of his own corporation, can decide what to do about it. We can either grow with it or go backward. We cannot stand still, even if we'd like to. This gives us an opportunity to stand back and look at ourselves and our futures objectively, as an intelligent stranger might. Ask yourself, how much am I worth right now, today, as a corporation? What's my value today to myself, my family, my company? If I were an outside investor, a stranger, would I invest in this corporation? A company growing at the rate of 10% a year will double in size in about eight years. What attention are you giving to the production of your personal corporation? Can you grow and improve as a person at least 10% a year? Of course you can. In fact, if we go along with the experts' estimates, a person can increase his effectiveness anywhere from 50 to 100% and more within 30 days. Our files are filled with reports from people who exceeded their previous performance to an almost unbelievable extent. People in management and in production who multiplied their effectiveness many times. Students who moved from failing grades to straight A's in the dean's list. People in sales who found they could, through the proper management of their abilities, minds, and time, sell as much of their company's products in a single month as they had previously sold in an entire year. Think what that means. It means being 12 times as effective as a human being. And getting back to the law of cause and effect, it means putting out 12 times as much service, which must and will guarantee our receiving eventually 12 times the reward we formerly knew. 12 times the reward. Remember, please, if we do twice as much, we have to receive twice as much, and nothing on earth can keep it from us. And the same thing applies if we triple our effectiveness. You and I know this, everyone should know it, but remember that fully 95% of the people do not know this. Think of the advantage this gives us. It isn't that we want to take advantage of anyone, and we're not. But it dramatically demonstrates the truth of the saying, knowledge is power. You'd be amazed by the great numbers of people who stop learning when school is over. Aside from company manuals and such internal literature, they read very little of anything of real value. The introduction to recorded learning, pioneered by this company, has made substantial gains and is growing rapidly, but as yet has only scratched the surface. An ongoing education is vital, if we're to stay vital. There's so much to learn, and our school curriculum touched only a fraction of it. One of the most important subjects is getting along with people. We can only do things, we can only win through people, and that subject isn't taught at all in school. The great ideas we're talking about on this program are seldom taught in the home and almost never in school. Go through our catalog of programs carefully, and one by one you can maintain an effective ongoing education program for many years to come. It's true. Knowledge is power. What's more, knowledge shows on our faces, and it's apparent in our speech. It helps us raise our children, get along better with our neighbors and fellow workers. Above all, perhaps, it's the greatest motivator in the world. As we learn, our horizons recede. We realize there's more to do and more time in which to do it. Old myths about getting out of action at age 65 disappear, and we realize that as long as we're learning and teaching and growing, it need never stop, and we become more effective with the passage of time. Tomorrow is a brand new day, the great equalizer, no more nor less than anyone else on earth can have. Right now, begin to think of ways in which you can begin to increase your effectiveness, raise your production, knowing that by so doing, you're automatically presetting your rewards. Each day that comes to you, beginning with tomorrow, offers you a clean, brand new page on which to write the story of your life. Forget the past. It's gone. Don't concern yourself with the opportunities you may have missed in the past. This is true of everyone. But reach out and take each new day as it comes and ask yourself, how can I best use this day? You know, we're going to run out of them eventually. If we waste an hour of productive time every day, it adds up to about 250 hours a year that our corporation, our plant is shut down. We can earn nothing with the doors closed. What is your time worth an hour? Multiply this by 250 and you can see what you're throwing away. Now, whether your employer pays for this wasted hour or not is unimportant. 
Life will not pay for it. Learn to enjoy every minute of your life. Be happy now. Don't wait for something outside of yourself to make you happy in the future. As my good friend Wally Amos of Famous Amos Chocolate Cookies says, happiness is an inside job. Think how really precious is the time you have to spend, whether it's at work or with your family. Every minute should be enjoyed, savored. A human life is really nothing more than a collection of minutes, hours, and days. These are the building materials, and it's left strictly up to us to determine the kind and size structure we build. You see, a person has a tremendous advantage over even the largest corporation. Think of any large multinational corporation. Can it double its production in a single day? Of course not. Can it double its sales in a single day? Of course not. It would like to, but its growth must be a gradual, steady thing because of the interconnecting complexities of operating so large an organization. Yet a person can double, triple, quadruple his effectiveness in a month or less. It's like comparing the movement of a single scout to the movement of a great army. How have you been handling the four vital functions of your business? Finance, production, sales, research. How much time and effort are you giving to finance, to research, to the study of your work, your career? Can this be improved? What about production? Is there a way in which you can vastly improve the way in which you conduct your work? And sales, how can that be improved? Sales is more than selling a product or service. It's the way in which we sell ourselves to everyone with whom we come in contact. It's the way we get along with our associates, our spouses, our kids, our neighbors. And if our business happens to be selling, how can we see more people every day or improve the effectiveness of every part of our contact? One extra call a day comes to 250 calls a year. How many additional sales could we make with 250 additional contacts? In five years, that comes to 1,250 calls we would not otherwise have made. It's the difference between being average or above average. It's the difference between good and great. Taking this new active approach to life brings peace to our minds, absolute security to our future, great new stature as human beings. In this way, we can work toward reaching full maturity. With this attitude toward life, we need never for a moment concern ourselves with its outcome. It will begin to become successful tomorrow, and it will pour abundance upon us for the rest of our years. Let's talk about money. Men and women have been concerned about money since the first coin was fashioned in Asia Minor about 700 BC. You might say that money is like good health in that we're concerned about it to the extent that we don't have it. The purpose of this message is to get down to the basics, to clear the air surrounding the entire subject of money. And to do this, I'm going to have to get absolutely elementary. And while you may already know most of the things I'm going to say, I think it's important that we remind ourselves just exactly what money is, how much of it is enough, and how to earn the amount of money you need to live the way you want to live now and in the important future years. To begin, let's get rid of the old myth once and for all that money is bad or unimportant. It is not bad, and it is important. It's vitally important. It's just as important as the food and clothes it buys, the shelter it affords, the education it provides, and the doctor's bills it pays. Money is important to any person living in a civilized society. To argue and split hairs to the effect that it's not as important as other things is absurd. Nothing will take the place of money in the area in which money works, and that's all there is to it. What is money? Money is the harvest of our production. Money is what we receive for our production and service as persons, and which we can then use to obtain the production and services of others. We can quite often accurately gauge the extent of our production and service by simply counting the amount of money we receive for it. You'll hear people say, money won't bring happiness. 
The earning and possession of money has brought a lot more happiness than has poverty. Money is a warm home and healthy children. It's birthday presents and a college education. It's a trip abroad and the means to help older people and the less fortunate. We're not saying that piling up a lot of wealth is important. What we're saying is that money is important because it's the only reward which is completely negotiable and can be used by everyone. Look at it this way. A diamond is more valuable than a lump of coal, yet that's exactly what a diamond was at one time. And just as a lump of coal can be transformed into one of the world's most valuable gems, a human being can vastly increase his or her own value to the world. Try to remember this formula. The amount of money we receive will always be in direct ratio to the demand for what we do, our ability to do it, and the difficulty of replacing us. A highly skilled human being is worth more money in our economy than a person who is not highly skilled and who can be easily replaced. Now, this is not to say that one person is any better than any other person or more important. Remember that in this message, we're only talking about money, nothing else. A janitor is just as important as a human being as a brain surgeon. But the amount of money they'll earn will be proportional to the demand for what they do, their ability to do what they do, and the difficulty of replacing them. A person can be trained to clean and maintain a building in a few weeks, and replacing the person is not difficult. A brain surgeon spent many years learning his profession, often at great personal sacrifice and at extremely high cost, and he cannot be easily replaced. As a result, the surgeon might earn as much money in an hour as a janitor might earn in a year. Now, these are extreme cases used to show the relation of income to demand, skill, and supply, and this is as it should be. This is why there are few limitations on a person within his or her company and industry. Their incomes will be in exact proportion to the demand for what they do, their ability to do what they do, and the difficulty of replacing them. That's why the whole idea of trying to get something for nothing is ridiculous and won't work. A top jockey will earn a great deal of money every year, which will represent about 10% of the winnings of the horses he rides. You might say riding a horse serves no useful purpose, but the demand is there, useful or not. It's the same with the star in show business. His or her income will very accurately reflect the demand for what he or she does. Now that's why preparation for life is so important. Luck has been defined, as we've mentioned, as what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. A great opportunity will only make the unprepared, the unqualified, appear ridiculous. For every one of us, opportunities are all around us. Our ability to see them will depend in large part on how well we've prepared ourselves. Now, how do you stack up in this regard? While this may sound elementary, you'd be amazed at the number of people who want more money but don't want to take the time and trouble to qualify for it. And until they qualify it, there's no way on earth for them to earn it. It's like the person who wants a good-looking figure but doesn't want to change eating habits. To nine-tenths of the world's population, the average North American is already rich. There's a greater difference between the standard of living of most of the world's population and our average worker than there is between the standard enjoyed by our average worker and the richest person in our society. Our working people have just about everything the wealthiest have, only smaller. They have a home, car, often two of them, radio, TV, savings account, debts. They're just smaller. Their food is as good and just as plentiful. Their beds are just as comfortable. Their home is just as warm in the winter. They have exactly the same amount of time and just as much, maybe more, freedom. Their life expectancy at birth is about 75 years. For the rest of the world, on the average, it's less than 60. With only a fraction of the world's population, we in the free world have half the world's total money income. We have more than two-thirds of all the automobiles on the planet. So in talking about money, let's understand that we're already rich as a people. Now, how much do you want? How much money do you need to live the way you want to live to accomplish the goals you've established for yourself? Most people think they want more money than they really do and settle for a lot less than they could earn if they went about it the right way. The world will pay you exactly what you bargain for, exactly what you earn, but not a penny more. Do you remember that old poem that goes, I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more? Well, that's about it. 
we'll receive not what we idly wish for, but what we justly earn. Our rewards will always be in exact proportion to our service. If you don't like your income, you must devise ways and means of increasing your service. Your service must come out of you, your mind, your abilities, and your energy. A strong person cannot make a weak person strong. But a weak person can become strong on his or her own by following a specific course of action for a sufficient length of time. And a person who's already strong can become a lot stronger. It's the same with this business of money. People who refuse to do more than they're being paid for will seldom be paid for more than they're doing. You may have heard someone say, why should I knock myself out for the money I'm getting? Now, it's this attitude which, more than anything else, keeps people at the bottom of the economic pile. They don't understand that only as we grow in value as persons will we receive the increased income we seek. If we try to stand still in our work, and millions do, we'll never know the rewards nor the joy of accomplishment and the personal satisfaction and peace of mind which come only to the person of unusual achievement. There are two distinct steps we must take. First, we must decide how much money we really want. The exact amount. Once this decision is made, the second step is to forget the money and concentrate on improving what we now do. Until we've grown to the size that will fit and naturally earn the income we seek. Once we're fully qualified for the amount of money we decide to earn, we'll soon find ourselves earning it. And we'll also discover that with our new powers and abilities, it's not more difficult, perhaps even less difficult, than what we're now doing for the money we're now earning. Ask yourself, how much money am I perfectly willing to earn, realizing that the amount I earn will be in exact proportion to my skills, the demand for what I do, and the difficulty of replacing me? There are really three amounts of money people should decide upon. One, the yearly income we want to earn now or in the near future, the amount of money we want to have in a savings and or investment account, and the amount of money we want as a retirement income, whether we ever retire from active work or not. Now, it's here that most people make a very serious mistake. They never decide on any of these three amounts of money. If you will decide on these three amounts, and if you'll write them on a card to carry with you or put somewhere where you can review it from time to time, you'll automatically have placed yourself in that top 5% we were talking about. You'll have a plan for your future, a blueprint for future financial accomplishment. You'll know where you're going. And if you're serious about it, you'll most certainly get there. You see, the trouble with people is not in achieving their goals. They can do that all right. It's in not setting goals that people get in trouble. They leave it to chance and find out sooner or later, and to their sorrow, that chance doesn't work, that they've missed the boat. It's estimated that only 5% decide on the money they'll earn and then grow as persons into the size of the incomes they seek. They thus take their lives, their fortunes, and their futures into their own hands as they should and accomplish their goals right on schedule all the years of their lives. You can do the same thing, and you can do it starting right now. There are two kinds of people where money is concerned. There's the majority who cut back on their wants to fit their incomes, and there are those free spirits in the minority who make their incomes fit their wants. Now, which is best for you? You've got to decide that. Ben Franklin gave us the secret to wealth. He said, the road to wealth lies in augmenting our means or diminishing our wants. Either will do, but the quickest way to wealth is to do both at the same time. When you write down the yearly income you mean to earn, you no doubt know whether or not it's average for the work you're in or above average. The chances are good that the figure you'll decide upon will be above average, perhaps quite a bit above average. That's good. Now ask yourself, who in my line of work is now earning that kind of money? If you know, you'll have a good idea of what you have to do in order to earn it. This is exactly how men and women move from the ranks into positions of top authority with corresponding incomes. Now, I have no way of knowing your line of business, but regardless of the business you're in, it needs new leaders, men and women, to come up in the years ahead. Everything is expanding, getting larger, and with the increase in size and scope, the most desperate need is for the dedicated, able person who can learn to lead, to lead the field, and to lead others as well. Some of the top executives in the nation today were once accountants, shipping clerks, struggling lawyers, service station attendants, salespeople in the field, sales clerks, mailroom clerks, 
stenographers, mechanics. You can't think of a position from which people have not climbed to the top. Now understand what I'm going to say, and it'll bring you and yours everything you want. It's not the job. It's the person. It's not your present circumstances which count, but the circumstances you make up your mind to achieve that are important. The only limit on your income is you. And the income you decide upon can be achieved within the framework of your present work, industry, or profession where you already have a start and a place. If not there, it can be found somewhere else. All you need is the plan, the roadmap, and the courage to press on to your destination, knowing in advance that there will be problems and setbacks, but knowing also that nothing on earth can stand in the way of a plan backed by persistence and determination. With the income written down that you intend to earn, spend a part of each day thinking of ways in which you can increase your service, knowing that you have only to manage this, and the income will take care of itself. Since the money you want to earn is more than you're now receiving, your part of the bargain is to find ways of increasing your service until the gap has been bridged, and more than bridged. Look at your card with the three amounts written on it. By setting a financial goal, you're demonstrating faith. You'll find that you'll begin to become what others call lucky. You'll begin to get good hunches and ideas. You'll take far more interest in everything about your work and your company. You'll see opportunities in your work and environment you've never noticed before. In fact, you'll soon discover you're no longer the same person. You'll care less about how others are doing their jobs and concern yourself more with the manner in which you do yours. By your example, you'll inspire others to do their jobs better. Have faith in yourself and the quiet, firm inner knowledge that you can and will accomplish your goals. Know that the answers you seek will come to you in their own time if you only keep looking for them. Above all, realize that money cannot be sought directly. Money, like happiness, is an effect. It's the result of a cause, and the cause is valuable service. Keep money in its proper place. It's a servant, nothing more. It's a tool with which we can live better, see more of the world, give our youngsters the education they need, and a good start in life. It's the means to a happy, carefree retirement in later years. Money is necessary to modern life, but keep it in its place. You need only so much food to enjoy good health. You really need only so much money to live comfortably, securely, and well. Too much emphasis on money reverses the whole picture. You then become the servant, and the money the master. As someone once put it, it's good to have money and the things money can buy, but it's good, too, to check up once in a while and make sure that you haven't lost the things that money can't buy. Every person should know happiness in his or her work and home and prosperity. These things can and should be yours. Play this message as often as you can during the next week. Fix your plans firmly in your mind and relax. Keep cool and calm. Be as serene as you possibly can be. You have nothing to worry about. Right now, you may have no idea at all how the additional income you seek is going to come to you, nor how you're going to save the amount you want in a savings account, or how you can possibly arrange for the retirement income you've decided upon. That isn't important. Remember that the only really important thing is that you know what you want. If you do, you will become, you must become, what you think about. Be realistic about your financial goals, or as you reach them, you can then set higher goals. Trying to jump too far too soon can often result in confusion, tension, worry. Take your growth in sensible, logical steps, remembering that the big thing is that you know what you want, and that you realize your rewards will match your service. That is, that you must devise ways and means of actually becoming the person who is worth the amount of money you've established for yourself. Now, a person may be worth more than he or she is getting for a while, but the two will match up. They have to. In fact, unless a person is worth more than he or she is receiving, well, they can't move ahead. They're receiving all they're worth. And it all gets back to the great law that controls everything in the universe, cause and effect. The cause must precede the effect or the effect cannot occur. This is why people who try to get something for nothing are only fooling themselves and earning the disillusionment and frustration they must one day reap. You can have what you want. You need only make up your mind.
I'm sure you'll agree we acquire the skills of living successfully through knowledge. Knowledge, properly applied, is power, and knowledge is available to everybody. The degree of a person's ignorance will determine his or her place in the world. Everyone is born ignorant and must for a time live in ignorance. But remember this, anyone who remains ignorant has only himself or herself to blame. An illiterate person in our society is in the lowest level of our social heap. And from that starting point, think once again of society as that pyramid with a broad base gradually rising to a high point. We know that the great majority of people are to be found in the bottom large layers of this pyramid. The higher you go, the smaller the layers. At the very peak of the pyramid, you'll find the world's most brilliant people. We may not have the native equipment to reach the topmost pinnacle, perhaps, although we certainly might, but we do control where we will live between the very top and the very bottom. We can most assuredly get into the top 5%, let's say the top five layers of the pyramid, and from here we can live well and successfully all the days of our lives. It isn't that we want to be over anyone, it's just having the ambition and good sense to not settle for anything less, to want to live the best we can. Remember, the higher you climb on a pyramid, the farther you can see, the fresher the air, and the less crowded it becomes. Another rewarding thing about climbing is that as we climb, we help most of those associated with us to climb too. One of the most important ladders leading to the top is knowledge. The more we know, the higher we can move. But where does a person begin? No one person can know everything. In fact, our store of knowledge is growing far too fast for anyone to keep up with it. It's like walking into the Library of Congress with its millions of volumes and trying to decide which single book to read first, knowing that even if you lived a thousand years, you couldn't read them all. Well, fortunately, the answer to this perplexing problem is known. A person should begin with the study of his language and then to his general area of interest. Two steps in that order that can move us right up there on the top of the pyramid. First, the language, in our case, English. Not enough people realize that it's our ability to use our language which will determine our place on the social pyramid and which will also control, to a great extent, the amount of money we will earn during our lives. A person may dress in the latest fashion and present a very attractive appearance, so far so good. But the minute he or she opens his or her mouth and begins to speak, he or she proclaims to the world his or her level on our pyramid. Shaw's play Pygmalion, later adapted into the musical comedy My Fair Lady, is an extreme example of what I'm talking about. Our use of the language is the one thing we cannot hide. Many years ago, the graduating class of a large university was given an examination in English vocabulary. The test scores were graded into groups of 5% each, the top 5% and so on to the bottom. At regular intervals during the next 20 years, questionnaires were sent to the surviving graduates, asking them their occupations, incomes, and so on. Without a single exception, those who scored highest on the vocabulary test were in the top income group while those who scored lowest were in the lowest income group. Reader's Digest published an article by Blake Clark entitled Words Can Work Wonders For You. In it, he wrote, Tests of more than 350,000 persons from all walks of life show that more often than any other measurable characteristic, knowledge of the exact meanings of a large number of words accompanies outstanding success. End of quote. He also mentioned the work done in this field by scientist Johnson O'Connor and gave O'Connor's best illustration of the importance of vocabulary. Tests were given to executive and supervisory personnel in 39 large manufacturing plants. The results showed that every one of the men tested rated high in the basic aptitudes that go with leadership. Differences in their vocabulary ratings, however, were definite and dramatic. Presidents and vice presidents averaged 236 out of a possible 272 points. Managers averaged 168. Superintendents, 140. Foremen, 114. Floor bosses, 86. In virtually every case, vocabulary correlated with executive level and income. Children with the best vocabularies get the best grades in school. A salesman in his 50s who was in the bottom 5% in vocabulary 
worked himself into the top 45% and is now vice president of his firm. An encouraging fact to keep in mind, Clark went on to say, is that when we master one word, we find that we've added several others. It's as if the new one is a nucleus of thought around which whirl numerous related ideas that we now come to understand. Deliberately learning ten new words, we pick up probably ninety more, almost without realizing it. You see, understanding our language is the key to studying and learning everything else. Literally millions of people are being held back in life simply because they've never taken the time to learn their own language. Let's face it, from the earliest times, the favored class of people has always been the educated class. They can make themselves recognized instantly anywhere by the simple expedient of speaking a few words. Our language, more than anything else, determines the extent of our knowledge. You see, everything in all the vast storehouse of knowledge has a name, a label. These names, these words, make up the language. The more words we know and can properly use, the more knowledge we have. Of this you can be sure. A person's knowledge and his language go together. It's almost impossible for one to be larger than the other. Before we move to the second point, which is knowledge in your field of general interest, make it a point to acquire books that will help you improve your vocabulary. You'll find them valuable additions to your library and an enormous help in your career. In addition to vocabulary... Effective English usage is important. This entails learning the parts of speech, what they mean, how they should be used to construct sentences. This, too, is a reflection of your present knowledge. Right now, mentally rate yourself on your use of the language. Would you say your rating would be excellent, good, fair, or poor? If you rated yourself excellent, you're in the top one-tenth of one percent of the population. If you said good, you're definitely in the top 5%. If you rated yourself fair, get a good book on English at your bookstore and study it. And if you rated yourself as poor, take a home study or night course in English. Many excellent courses are available. Impress on your youngsters the importance of knowing their language, the importance of speech. More people speak English now than any other language on the planet, with the possible exception of Chinese. English literature, from Chaucer to Eliot, from Shakespeare to Hemingway, is the richest and most extensive on earth. So when you're studying English, you're studying one of the world's greatest and most interesting subjects. If you think you don't have time to study, listen to what Lewis Shores has to say about this. He said each of us must find his own 15-minute period each day for reading. It's better if it's regular. The only requirement is the will to read. With it, you can find 15 minutes no matter how busy the day. That means you'll read half a book a week, two books a month, 20 a year, and 1,000 in a reading lifetime. It's an easy way to become well-read, and it takes just 15 minutes a day. Now let's get to our second area of study, our general interest. Everyone has something in which he or she is interested more than in other subjects. This is true of the salesperson, doctor, architect, executive, or student. Reading in this area is for profit, and we should read for pleasure as well. Once we have a regular program going along to improve our knowledge of our language, we should begin a systematic study of the field which interests us most and which will help us reach our goal just that much sooner. I received a letter from one of my radio listeners, a woman, saying it was her ambition to write poetry. There was a telephone number on her letter, so I called her. I asked her how long she'd been studying poetry and what kind of a collection of published poetry she had. She told me she didn't have a single book on poetry and had never read it as a study. I mention this because it's so often the case. People will say they want to do a particular thing, but a bit of questioning quickly reveals that it's a whim, not a real and important goal. If we're interested in boating, we subscribe to boating magazines and usually have a collection of books on boating. Stories of the Sea, a collection of the works of Conrad, and we usually know, down to the bilge pumps and mooring lines, exactly the kind of boat we want. I know because I have such a collection. I also have a wonderful collection of books on English, including poetry, great fiction, the great books, several excellent dictionaries, and a number of books on writing and style and mistakes to avoid. Our company has published on tape cassette one of the finest programs on vocabulary building ever put together, and you can listen to it and repeat the words as you drive your car. 
Other motorists might think you're a bit batty, but you'll be learning in the best way possible by listening and repeating a fine vocabulary of the English language. Most languages can number their words under 200,000. The English language has more than 600,000 and is still growing every day. None of us can learn them all, although professors of English come very close. Incidentally, the number two person in the country in the use of his language is the corporation president, and that's no accident. Our ability to translate our thoughts and ideas into words in a powerful and effective way is inextricably linked to our growth in the world of business or any other organization. In addition to English, each of us should have a good working knowledge of world history, and especially the history of our own country and the history of the idea of human freedom. Millions of Americans don't know how truly fortunate they are to be able to openly criticize their government and its leaders, to be able to bring suit against public officials, to call an attorney of their choice in case of arrest and be judged by a jury of their peers. Did you know that as far as is known, there has never been a sentence of innocent in the Soviet court? If you go to trial in Russia, believe me, you're guilty, and you're going to prison or a work camp. In hundreds of countries, you could be subjected to torture without recourse. My wife and I were talking to a couple in South Africa some years ago, a white couple, and they said to us with feeling, my God, when the plane lands in the United States, you can smell the freedom. Most Americans, believe it or not, don't know anything about the idea of personal liberty, nor how difficult it was to come by, nor how precious it is nor do they have the foggiest notion of their true options and opportunities. I think a good personal library is essential. It should contain good books and a dozen or so excellent tape cassette programs. The tape cassette is the greatest idea for learning since the invention of the printing press. It's effortless, yet so effective. When you listen to the human voice, you're learning the way you learned most of what you know. It's the most natural way to learn. And while a book is often read only once... Tape cassettes can be listened to over and over again, months and years later. And perhaps most importantly, they can be listened to while doing other things, while dressing in the morning, while driving the car, while having a snack or at the dinner table so that the entire family can soak up some information. Those without a good library, and they don't even build bookshelves in American homes anymore unless they're specified by an architect, they're seriously handicapped. They miss so much of the fun, the joy of learning the things we want to learn. Books and cassettes are not an expense item. They're an investment, and as far as we know, the best investment on earth. They pay us dividends out of all proportion to their small cost, and not just in pleasure and knowledge, but in cash, in income. As someone has written, books extend our narrow present back into the limitless past. They show us the mistakes of the men and women before us, and share with us recipes for human success. There's nothing to be done which books, and let me add tape cassettes, will not help us do much better. To try to live without constantly expanding our knowledge is to close our eyes not just to the whole purpose of life, but to the facts of life as well. Never before has the world moved so rapidly as it's moving today. We must make up our minds to move with it, to stay up with it, to grow and prosper with it, or just fall by the wayside. Not just because it's the best way to our goals, but because it's the way to really enjoy living, as the skillful sailor enjoys the sea. So often a person will live in the shallows from force of habit, or because those around him are wasting their time without realizing that only a thin screen of reeds separates him from the fine deep ocean beyond. He or she can sail to any chosen port, if the time has been taken and the effort expended, to build a good boat. Now let me make an important point. The person who knows where he or she is going and who's made up his or her mind to get there is going to make the grade regardless of education. If an education is necessary to the accomplishment of the goal, well, he or she will get it. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence and determination. I think it's important to succeed in every department of our lives, and becoming well-educated is one of the most vital. What good is a large material success if a person has remained too ignorant to enjoy it or to administer it? Now let's recap. Knowledge is power. The more our knowledge, the more power we can exercise over our lives and our futures. 
Think of human society as a pyramid composed of layers beginning with the broad base and narrowing to a pinnacle at the top. Pick the place on the pyramid you're going to shoot for and start climbing. Since there's far too much knowledge for any one person to assimilate, where can we start? First, with our language, and next, with our general area of interest, two subjects which can keep us growing and interested for the rest of our lives. Remember that our language is the one thing we cannot hide except by silence. Let's bring it up to the point where it can do the job for us we want it to do. To a surprising extent, our ability to use our language and the extent of our vocabulary will determine our income and our future. Use our excellent cassette programs in vocabulary building and spend at least 15 minutes every day reading something, not only interesting, but calculated to stretch your mind a little more. Remember that a mind stretched by a new idea can never again return to its original dimensions. It's estimated that the average person adds only five new words a year to his or her vocabulary. That's not nearly enough for this day and age. We should add that many a week. Many popular magazines publish features which will help you in this area. And finally, realize that graduating from school is just the beginning, the commencement of our days and years of learning. For with wisdom will come kindness and patience, love, understanding, and success as a person. It's never too late to begin. We've talked about the definition of success as the progressive realization of a worthy goal. The purpose of this message is to tell you of a wonderful way to keep realizing, to keep achieving your goals one after another in the years ahead. A goal sometimes seems so far off and our progress often appears to be so painfully slow that we have a tendency to lose heart. It sometimes seems we'll never make the grade, and we come close to falling back into old habits which, while they may be comfortable now, lead to nowhere. Well, there's a way to beat this. It's been used successfully by many of the world's most successful people, and it's been advocated by many of the greatest thinkers. It's to live successfully one day at a time. A lifetime is comprised of days strung together into weeks, months, and years. Let's reduce it to the lowest common denominator, a single day, and then still further to each task of that day. A successful life is nothing more than a lot of successful days put together. It's going to take so many days to reach your goal. If this goal is to be reached in a minimum of time, every day must count. Now think of a single day as a building block with which you're building the tower of your life. Just as a stonemason can put only one stone in place at a time, you can live only one day at a time. And it's the way in which these stones are placed which will determine the beauty, the strength of your tower. If each stone is successfully placed, the tower will be a success. If, on the other hand, they're put down in a hit-or-miss fashion, the whole tower is in danger. Now, this may seem to be a rather elementary way of looking at it, but I want to make it clear, and it's a good and logical way of looking at a human life. All right, then, let's take it one day at a time. From the time we wake up in the morning till we drop off to sleep that night, keeping our goal in mind as often as possible. Now, each day consists of a series of tasks, tasks of all kinds, and the success of a day depends upon the successful completion of most of these tasks. Now, if everything we do during the day is a success, that is, done in the best fashion of which we're capable, we can fall asleep that night in the comfortable knowledge that we've done our very best, that our day has been a success, that one more stone has been successfully put into place. Now, this is the way to really live. Do each day all that can be done that day. You don't need to overwork or to rush blindly into your work trying to do the greatest possible number of things in the shortest possible time. Don't try to do tomorrow's or next week's work today. 
It's not so much the number of things you do, but the quality, the efficiency of each separate action that counts. The quality of what you do. Gradually, you'll find yourself increasing the number of tasks and performing them all much more efficiently. To get the habit of success, and that's why successful people go from one success to another because it's a habit with them, to get the habit of success, you need only to succeed in the small tasks of each day. This makes a successful day. Enough of these, and you have a successful week, month, year, and lifetime. This is why I say success is not a matter of luck. Far from it. It can be predicted and guaranteed, and anyone can achieve it by following this plan. Almost before you realize it, you'll have achieved your goal. In looking back, you'll realize that your success was not attributable to any one day, week, or month, but rather it was the consistent, unrelenting, successful succession of single days that turned the trick. This is the way a skyscraper, a home, or a human life is successfully built. One successful day at a time, and each day comprising a collection of successful tasks, one successful task at a time. In order to advance to the place you've chosen, two things are necessary. One, that you keep your eye on your goal. And two, that you continue to grow from the standpoint of competence and effectiveness. Don't get impatient. Don't let the hundreds of little distractions which each day try to get you off course bother you. Pay no attention to them. Shake them off and stay steadily on the track. Concentrate on each task of the day from morning to night and do each as successfully as you can. Know full well that if each of your tasks is performed successfully, or at least the greater majority of them, your life has to be successful. There's no other answer. There's no way to avoid it. The men and women who are certain to advance are the ones who become too big for their jobs and who have a clear concept of what they want to be, who know what they can become, what they want to become, and who are determined to be what they want to be. Remind yourself at this time that people become exactly what they make up their minds to become. Are you too big for your present job? If it's obvious to you that you are, it's obvious to others. You know, people are not given promotions as a rule. They promote themselves by becoming too big for their jobs and by making up their minds exactly what bigger and better job or income they're shooting for. And this is done by taking one day at a time, one task at a time during each day. But how do we separate the important tasks from the unimportant? Did you ever hear of the single idea for which a man was paid $25,000 and it was worth every penny of it? The story goes that the president of a big steel company had granted an interview to an efficiency expert named Ivy Lee. Lee was telling his prospective client how he could help him do a better job of managing the company when the president broke in to say something to the effect that he wasn't at present managing as well as he knew how. He went on to tell Ivy Lee that what was needed wasn't more knowing, but a lot more doing. He said, we know what we should be doing. Now, if you can show us a better way of getting it done, I'll listen to you and pay you anything within reason you ask. Well, Lee then said that he could give him something in 20 minutes that would increase his efficiency by at least 50%. He then handed the executive a blank sheet of paper and said, write down on this paper the six most important things you have to do tomorrow. Well, the executive thought about it and, and did as requested. It took him about three or four minutes. Then Lee said, now number those items in the order of their importance to you under the company. Well, that took another three or four or five minutes, and then Lee said, now put the paper in your pocket, and the first thing tomorrow morning, take it out and look at item number one. Don't look at the others, just number one, and start working on it. And if you can, stay with it until it's completed. Then take item number two the same way, then number three, and so on till you have to quit for the day. Don't worry if you've only finished one or two, the others can wait. If you can't finish them all by this method, you could not have finished them with any other method. And without some system, you'd probably take ten times as long to finish them and might not even have them in the order of their importance. Do this every working day, Lee went on. After you've convinced yourself of the value of this system, have your men try it. Try it as long as you like. And then send me your check for whatever you think the idea is worth. The entire interview hadn't taken more than a half hour. In a few weeks, the story has it that the company president sent Ivy Lee a check for $25,000 with a letter saying the lesson was the most profitable, from a money standpoint, he'd ever learned in his life. 
And it was later said that in five years, this was the plan that was largely responsible for turning what was then a little-known steel company into one of the biggest independent steel producers in the world. One idea, the idea of taking things one at a time in their proper order, of staying with one task until it's successfully completed before going on to the next, of living one day at a time. For the next seven days, try the $25,000 idea in your life. Tonight, write on a slip of paper the six most important things you have to do. Then number them in the order of their importance. And tomorrow morning, go to work on number one. Stay with it till it's successfully completed, then move on to number two, and so on. When you've finished with all six, get another piece of paper and repeat the process. You'll be astonished and delighted at the order it brings into your life, and at the rate of speed with which you'll be able to accomplish the things that need doing in the order of their importance. Now, this simple but tremendously effective method will take all the confusion out of your life. You'll never find yourself running around in circles, wondering what to do next. Remember, as you do, to live the best you can, one day at a time. You need not worry about tomorrow or the next day or what's going to happen at the end of the month. One day at a time, handled successfully, will carry you over every hurdle. It'll solve every problem. You can relax in the happy knowledge that successful tasks make successful days, which in turn build a successful life. This is the kind of unassailable logic no one can argue with. It will work every time for every person. The reason for writing down what you consider only the most important things to do is obvious. Handling each task during the day successfully is important to the degree of the importance of the tasks themselves. Doing a lot of unnecessary things successfully can be pretty much of a waste of time. Make certain that the tasks you take the time to do efficiently are important tasks. Tasks which move you ahead steadily toward your goal. So often, youngsters in school worry about a passing grade. They think of all they'll have to do before the end of the school year. Following this course of action, they can stop worrying completely and count on excellent grades. Freshmen in high school and college are frequently plagued by doubts as to whether or not they'll be able to successfully complete the four years ahead and graduate. Four years seem like such a long time to them, almost forever. And this thought sometimes leads to a sort of giving up, a fear of failure. It was the great Harvard teacher and psychologist William James who said, in effect, let not students worry about the success of their efforts. If they will do each day as best they can the work which is before them, they will wake up one day to find themselves among the competent people of their generation. Student, junior executive, homemaker, senior executive, or professional, this plan works for everybody. It removes doubt, fear, and worry and brings order into our lives. All any of us needs to do is face each day as it comes in good cheer, knowing that we have only to succeed today to guarantee our future. In this way, we'll move steadily ahead, growing more competent, more confident with the passing of every day. Others may seem to suddenly shoot up faster and possibly fall much farther and operate in spurts and fits, but it's to the steady that the rewards are eventually paid. St. Edmund of Canterbury was right when he said, Work as though you would live forever, but live as though you would die tomorrow. Now try writing down the six most important things you have to do tomorrow. Then number them in the order of their importance. Really do this. First thing tomorrow morning, tackle number one. Stay with it till it's completed. If something should force its delay, move on to number two. But take them in order and finish them in order as best you can. Try not to get sidetracked by people or things in successfully accomplishing each task of your day. Beside my typewriter, I have glued to the wall a great saying by Ernest Hemingway. He said, write as well as you can and finish what you start. There's nothing mysterious or capricious about achieving outstanding success. It's completely within our individual control and is absolutely predictable. It's simply a matter of doing certain things a certain way every day, and that's all there is to it, as long as you've got that goal to work toward. There's no valid reason on earth why you should not become really successful in your field, your home life, and your community. Remember that everything in the entire limitless universe operates on the law of cause and effect. There are no exceptions to this. Nothing happens by accident. 
For every result, there's a cause. You have only to take care of the cause. The effect will always, without exception, take care of itself. Good cause, good effect. No cause, no effect. Bad cause, bad effect. It's as reliable as the rising of the sun. This business of living one day at a time the best we can has an almost unbelievable cumulative effect for good, for success, and the things we want. Sometimes when we see a bricklayer starting on a building and putting the first brick in place, we're struck by the size of the job he has ahead of him. But one day, almost before we realize it, he's finished. All the thousands of bricks are in place, each one vital to the finished structure, each one sharing its portion of the load. And so should be the days of a human life, and we'll be proud and happy with the finished product. All businesses, all organizations, from the smallest to the very largest, need a leader. They have their committees, their echelons of command, and perhaps a widely dispersed group of semi-autonomous divisions. But the overall company in each of its divisions must have strong and able leadership. Contrary to popular belief, you do not raise morale in an organization. It filters down from the top. The attitudes of the people working in any organization will always reflect the attitude of the leader. And finally, this leader will always be found to be just one person. The man or woman on the white horse. I'm sure you're aware that even the largest and oldest companies with many thousands of employees and hundreds of management people will, when they find themselves in trouble or not doing as well as they should, seek out one person and place him or her in the position of final authority. The whole company, the board of directors, and perhaps thousands of stockholders all look to this one person for leadership and success. The case of Chrysler and Lee Iacocca is an excellent example. Incidentally, we have Mr. Iacocca on a tape cassette program, and it's excellent. Whatever you find a successful going concern, whether it's a gas station, a supermarket, a school club, PTA, or a well-organized home, you'll find behind its success an outstanding leader. This is the most valuable person in society. In industry, he or she makes the wheels turn, the entire economy work. This is the person who's been responsible for the growth of nations and their position in the world. The employer of millions, the dreamer, the planner, and a clock to him or her is something that other people watch. You'll find this person working early and late, and when not working, he or she is usually thinking and planning. Way back during the Depression of the 1930s, the phrase most often heard by employers was, I'll do anything, just give me a job. Millions were unemployed. Thousands of business firms had closed their doors, and outside employment offices, long lines of people stood waiting for any kind of work. It was during this time in Long Beach, California, crowded to overflowing with thousands who had migrated there looking for work when there wasn't enough work to go around for the permanent residents, it seemed, that a friend of mine made an interesting discovery. He found that he could go to work almost anywhere he chose. Now, amazing as this may sound, it was absolutely true. It dawned upon him one day that the business establishments of various kinds were just as anxious to succeed as were the people looking for work. The owners and managers of these businesses were worried and concerned over the hard times which had descended upon the country and a great many of them were looking for someone to come to their aid, the person who would somehow show up and solve their business problems. But all they heard was people asking for work and saying, I'll do anything. These people were asking for a paycheck from a company which was very likely teetering on the brink of financial ruin itself. And so signs appeared in windows all over the land reading, No Help Wanted. This was a negative form of advertising, and while it kept the plaintive hordes away from the door, it also hurt business. Well, this friend of mine decided to become a part of the solution instead of a part of the problem. And his method was simple, and it worked like a charm. 
he selected the kind of business he felt he would like to work in and in which he could build a career. He then devoted a month to finding out all he could about that particular business. He talked to other people in the same line. He heard their problems and what they felt was wrong. He talked for hours, asking questions, probing about what they felt was needed and so on. He went to the public library and read everything he could find on that industry. And then he began to think of ways and means by which this business might be improved. When he was ready and finally made his call on the company for which he had decided to work, instead of asking for a job, he said to the boss something like this, I believe I know of several ways in which your business can be greatly increased, and I'd like to talk to you about them. Well, here he was, selling the one thing on earth in which his prospect was most interested. The fact that he knew a good deal about the business now permitted him to talk intelligently. He took a positive attitude, expressed a willingness to pitch in and help put the business on a sound and profitable footing. And, of course, that's right, he got the job. Millions out of work and asking for jobs. But one man who found a way to be of help. What had he done? Well, first he had specialized. He had selected one line of work and decided that that was where his future would be. Now he had to prove himself, and he did. The jack-of-all-trades and master of none was the man who suffered during the Depression. People who knew what they were doing and where they were going sailed through those Depression years just like a large ship sailed through a storm. It wasn't as comfortable as it could have been, but at least the crossing was a success. At least they didn't founder. And thousands of businesses actually grew larger and prospered during the Depression. The best way for you to develop the security that lasts a lifetime is to become outstanding at one particular line of work. Look at it this way. Regardless of economic ups and downs, the industry of which that line of work is a part will continue to operate. It won't shut down completely. As long as you're in the top 5% of the people in that industry, you know you'll always be in demand. You'll be wanted and needed, not just where that industry is concerned, but where you and your family are concerned also. The man or woman who becomes truly outstanding at what he or she does has the world on a string. Here's the person of confidence and peace of mind. Here's the person who's quietly aware of his or her ability and intimate knowledge of his or her job in particular industry. Here's the homemaker or student who's at the top of the group. They've got it made, and they and everybody else know it. Ask yourself this question. Am I now such a person? Down deep inside, you know the answer. If you answered yes, you're among the most fortunate people and in one of the smallest and most elite groups on earth. If your answer was no, it can be turned into a yes in a surprisingly short time. The first step is to make one really big and important decision. It's a decision the great majority of people never make and suffer as a result. Failing to make this decision keeps a person from ever really getting on course or clarifying his or her goals. If you make the decision I'm now going to recommend, you can take a deep breath, give a comfortable sigh of relief, fix your eyes firmly upon your target, and go to work relaxed, comfortable, and sure in the knowledge that the success you seek will be yours. The great steel magnet Andrew Carnegie, when asked the formula for success, answered, put all your eggs in one basket, and then watch that basket. Let's be frankly realistic. Who gets laid off work during an economic slump? Well, what gets thrown over the side when a ship is in danger of going down? Everything not absolutely essential to the operation of the vessel and the safety of its passengers. And it's the same with a business or any other organization. It has to be that way. With a corporation, its main purpose is to remain in business forever. As long as it remains in business, it can provide a needed product or service, protect the investment of those who have faith in it, and provide jobs for those who are essential to its continuity of operation. It's the duty of management to protect the firm and the people who depend upon it, just as it's the captain's duty to do everything in his power to keep his ship sailing. All a person needs to do is make certain that he or she is a vital part of the business or organization. Those who insist on remaining spare gear, those who do no more than they must in order to squeak by, those who say, I'm not going to do any more than I'm paid to do, must expect to be jettisoned when things get too rough for safety. Nobody, particularly the captain, likes to see cargo thrown over the side, but if it'll help save the ship, there's nothing else to do. That's why people are laid off. 
It has nothing to do with management and labor relations or personalities, and in the long run, it's best for everyone, since once smooth sailing has again been reached, additional employment can again be made available. So each of us must decide whether we want to be part of the cargo or a member of the crew. It's said that millions suffer today from a malady called panophobia. Panophobia means literally fear of everything. It's an uneasy feeling, a feeling of insecurity that generally manifests itself as a sort of lump of fear that settles right behind the belt buckle, especially on Sunday evenings and on Monday mornings. There's nothing you can put your finger on. It's just a, an apprehension, a feeling of foreboding. And this extremely unpleasant condition is said to result from the unspoken but realized fact that we're getting credit for more than we're actually doing or that we're doing less than we could be doing. It's the perfectly natural and normal understanding deep within each of us that there's something basically wrong about getting praise that's not earned, or if you're an employee, being paid for something you're not doing as well as you possibly can. If we have panophobia, running doesn't do any good. We find it follows us on vacation and around the house and yard on weekends. It's inside us, and no matter how fast the jet we board or how exciting the television program we're watching, soon we're aware of it again. Now, there's a simple cure for this malady. It's to throw ourselves not out of a window, but into activity, into our work. It's the decision to be worth more than we're being paid. Only in this way can we grow. It's overbalancing the scales in the service we give, knowing that our rewards must follow as a natural result. Anyone who will be honest with himself or herself realizes that he or she has been happiest and most satisfied after having successfully completed a difficult job. A leader is a person who can help and lead others. It's the conscientious mother who wants her children to grow up knowing the rules for success and happiness. It's the father who shows by example that any job worth doing is worth doing well. It's the student who studies to learn, not just to get a grade, who has a mind of his or her own and sets the pace for his or her fellow students. It's the farmer whose farm sets an example in his area, and the small businessman or woman whose business continues to grow and prosper with the passing years. It's the employee who has the good sense to realize that one gets most out of any job by giving loyalty and dedication to the firm that pays his or her wages. A leader is any person who realizes the importance of becoming a bigger and better person with the passing of every day, week, and month. A leader takes the responsibility of his or her own growth, a planner, a thinker, a doer. Each of us can become such a leader in our own area of activity. It's not difficult, and in the long run it's easier for us and on us than what at first may appear to be the easier of two courses. Simply fix your eye upon your goal, visualize it with every ounce of your being, enjoy the prospect of it, and courageously set out toward it. Maintain a cheerful, helpful attitude toward everyone. Why shouldn't you be cheerful since you know you'll achieve everything you've set your heart upon? Become a kind of sponge for information which will help you on your way. You don't have to waste years making the mistakes others have made before. You'll be surprised at how quickly you'll reach your goal, but don't be impatient. No and have faith that what should come to you will come to you in the right time. Everything in the world works on the side of the person who works with nature's laws. And above all, if you should forget everything else, remember that everything about you, everything you will ever have, know, experience in any way, operates as a result of law, law that is true and unchanging, the law of the stars and of the balance of the world. As Emerson wrote, let him learn a prudence of a higher strain. Let him learn that everything in nature, even dust and feathers, go by law and not by luck, and that what he sows, he reaps. Look about you. Take stock of your present situation, because there's nothing more nor less than the result of your past sowing. Are you happy with it? Is it what you want? Then you know what you must sow, today and tomorrow and the next day. And in the sowing... Rest in the calm, serene, and cheerful certainty that having sown, you will then reap the rich results that come automatically all the years of your life, the abundant harvest. Now this is Earl Nightingale reminding you that success as a human being in modern society does not come naturally. 
It requires the conscious utilization of ourselves in the service of others. We have our minds, our genetic possibilities, a certain amount of time, and our free will. We belong to the world minority that lives in a free society. We can become whatever we seriously make up our minds to become. That's possible because whatever we seriously decide to do is naturally linked to our genetic possibilities. A person with little or no aptitude for science will never decide to become a scientist. A naturally shy and retiring person will never apply for a job in sales, or if he does, he'll soon get out of it. Each of us has his or her own inner voice. Emerson referred to it as that iron string that vibrates within us. Each of us wants to succeed during our holiday on Earth, and each of us should. But we don't succeed in groups. We succeed or fail as individuals. The Lead the Field program you've heard on these tape cassettes contains the best basic information and the great ideas we need to reach whatever goal we seriously choose. Listen to these tapes often. You'll be astonished to discover how much you missed with your first and second listening. And there's a very good reason why this happens. As we listen to a message, an idea will catch our interest and we concentrate on it for a few seconds or longer. Now, while we are thus engaged, we miss what's being said during the time we're concentrating on that idea. It's like lifting the tone arm on a record. Now, the next time, we won't stop listening when that idea appears, and we will really hear, consciously for the first time, what immediately follows. Think of this program, and the other Nightingale Conant programs you order in the future, as your partners in success. You can always refer back to them. You'll find yourself delighted by the new enthusiasm and excitement you'll experience as you bring new meaning, new rewards into your life. Thank you.